been a long night. Uh, let's give a big hand to Dave Effer. Wherever Dave is. He's not even on vacation. He just oh, doesn't Dave. want to do shows. He's an elitist. If Trey's not on the show, he won't do the show. That's correct. I heard Dave hates storm chasers. Well, I think he's just uh -oh. afraid of getting wet. That's what it is. <laughs> So we've got uh, we've got some of the creme de la creme, as they say down in uh, New Orleans, joining us tonight with uh, all the storm chasing and cloud chasing and thunder chasing, and uh, very apropos since the middle of uh, Texas is just getting bombed with rain. I don't know if the rest of the world cares, but it hasn't rained here in I think what is it like 17 years? It hasn't rained. Something. It's close. 15. Yeah. 18. 15 years. Oh, 18. Years. All right. So it's been a while. But uh, it's actually raining like crazy. That's due to the Heart Program. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with the Heart Program, the High Auroral Amplitude Research Project, where the government is beaming microwaves into the upper atmosphere to affect weather? Mm, I thought that was just uh, uh, chemtrails. No, no, no. That's a completely so, different a reality. Different thing. Okay. Yeah, that's a different reality. But. Uh, like, uh, so we've yeah, got very familiar with it. Everybody, you know, on a daily basis on the Clouds 365 project, they uh, they'll they'll mention the you know, if I post a cloud and they they'll say it's part of the Heart Project or Supercell or whatever it is. So I hear from those guys a lot. Well, why are you laughing, Kelly? Uh, this isn't funny. I mean, this is serious science going on here. I've got my latest issue of Alex Jones's magazine right over here. If I need to break it out, I will. Don't make me, but I will. Which is <laughs> yes. So anyway, so we're going to get into all of that good stuff this evening. Uh, all of you fellows here are, are ready to break out your best storm chaser moments. Is that correct? Look, and we see in the background over here that uh, Jim Reed actually has his bomb-proof, tornado-proof cases there. Are those for demonstration purposes? Uh, I'm ready to go at a moment's notice. Now, I was told that you don't actually have any equipment in there. It's just hair product. Is that correct? Uh, Amway. It's, oh, it's Amway. All right. That's good. So they're going to do a little bit at the end of the whole thing, show people how they can make money while chasing clouds with their friends. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my side business. <laughs> good. I like it. I like it. So in that picture behind you, yeah, people think you're chasing tornadoes or something, but it's really you were stopping to see if any of these Oklahoma people in that hay field uh, wanted to buy some soap or hair product, right? <laughs> That's right, and uh, we have to be quick, as you might imagine, but uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a lucrative business, actually, especially in Oklahoma. Yeah, well, you got, man's got to do what his man's got to do. Oh, I just realized my camera fell off the back. You guys are staring at me. I look away I look away for two seconds and then <laughs> well, I was trying to simulate. I was simulating what it's like in a storm, you know? I mean things go crazy. <laughs> I thought you needed to be off camera for a couple minutes. I thought it was a crop the shot the whole time. I didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, every once in a while when I need to take a take a little pull off the old grandpa's cough syrup here, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, mute the camera. So anyway, what is this? Uh, is this like what is what's a lot of stogie? No, no, no. It's, it's a, yes, oh, he, he did. Is. Jim yeah. Reed. Look at Jim. Yeah, he's so much cooler than us. When I grow up, I want to. Yes, I am. I'm a lot older too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. At his age, what does it matter? Smoke all you want, oh, right? I'm actually <laughs> sitting on a medical scooter. <laughs> hey, in pre-show, I've already got a question. It says, how do we get to watch Mike Mazzul speak? <laughs> you have a fan base already. You're the first, already got a question for you. Oh, wow. Is it like, is he single, or what kind of question is it? It's the ladies coming in. That's what it is. What? Yeah. You know it. So yeah. if, you, if you are watching the show and you do have questions, thank you for bringing that up. You can go to Trey's site at stuckincustoms.com. And I'm going to go look right now just to make sure it's up there. Yeah, there it is. And you can connect uh, to GeekBeat IRC, which is really easy. You just give yourself a name and connect. And you are, uh, you're you're in the chat section. And you can also, in the new Geno, in the new interface, if they're watching it from Google+, Plus, over on the on the side of the broadcast within Google+, Plus should be a Q&A interface that they can see. Mm -hmm. A Q and A interface. That yeah, it's like, like a little bit terms. on the on the right. So on the next to the broadcast. Oh, I see. Yes. All right. So um, keep that in mind, too, guys. When you're if you're gonna type away, make sure you mute your microphone. Otherwise, 
your typing overloads the show. So make sure you self mute a lake if you're going to type. But what if we don't have a keyboard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. You're on your own. All right. So why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, it's nine oh two. So why don't, in here in Central Standard Time, why don't we go ahead and get this show going? We can introduce yourselves as yeah. as everybody on the planet knows. I'm Gino Barasa. And uh, right over here is Trey Ratcliffe, also known as Curtis Simmons. Hello, Gino. How are you? you tell everybody a little bit about what you do and how they can get in touch with you, Curtis, if they want to follow the Curtis Simmons. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm uh, Curtis. I run the back end of things uh, for the business of Stuck and Customs. And so just pretty much everything except taking photos. So at some point, I've got my hand in. And so you can get a hold of me at Curtis at StuckandCustoms.com. And I have a meager little blog called Curtis.si, um, which I paid hefty money to a Sylvanian company and gave them my credit card for that address, but I have no idea what they're doing with it. But I, it took quite a bit of effort to get that .si domain. So, uh, wow. But you're also doing quite a bit of photography yourself these days. You've been on, you went on the New Zealand workshop with Trey, right? Yes. I'm just trying to be a sponge. It's, I, I uh, get free tutorials. It's one benefit. So. Man. Awesome. Uh, although Trey doesn't like answering questions, so I don't. I don't show my photography, so I just. <laughs> I I don't know, Gino. I don't know if you feel this way, but you post photos, um, in your stream, and Trey is your friend, and like one out of fifty, he'll like, and you're like, has he seen all of my photos? <laughs> and he and he liked that one, which means he didn't like forty nine of them, well, or is it just he happened to see that one? Yeah, that's not been my experience. He doesn't like any of my pictures, <laughs> but he will every once in a while. He'll write something in, in, in one of my pictures like, this one doesn't suck as hard as the others. You know, <laughs> he'll write something like that. So I always yeah. take that. Like, I'll hey. screen capture it and show it to all my friends. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Trey said I don't suck. So uh, <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Uh, let, why don't we go. Uh, what is that? Which way is this way? Right? I'm not sure. Mike. Yeah, we'll go with Mr. Th is it Thies? That's Tice. Tice. Let's yeah. just call you Thies for the rest of the show. Ah, uh, Thies is fine. Tice, all right, Mike Tice. That was, wait a minute, Mike Tice was a was an NFL coach for a while there, but he spelled his name from Minnesota. That's right, yeah. he was. That's right. All right. Well, anyway, this is this is the Mike Tice. So tell us a little bit about you and how people can find you. Uh, well, I was born and raised in the Florida Keys, and I've always been passionate about hurricanes, and it evolved to tornadoes and all weather aspects. And I try to get to every type of weather event I can. I wish I could. Um, duplicate myself and be everywhere at once, but I can't, but I try my best. Uh, and you can find me at ExtremeNature.com and on Twitter at, at MikeTice.com, spelled T-H-E-I-S-S. -S. Just real quick, do, I don't have, is my video coming up? Oh, yeah. Or, oh, okay. Oh, you just don't, you just see everybody else. Yeah. Um, I guess. Oh, okay, because I don't see my, any feed coming up. That's the only reason I asked. You're good. Uh, I, okay, good. So you guys can see me wonderful. Yeah, do you see um, all the little faces across the bottom of the screen? I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, and is there a blue outline around one of them? No. Okay, well then that's what you should be on. If you if you've accidentally clicked on one of the pictures, you'll get oh. stuck on that feed. So you have to click on it again to go back to the main feed if that happens. Just click on all the pictures or what? No, I just it, in other words, if one of them's got a blue highlight around it, that means yeah. you clicked on it and you're only going to see oh, the Oh, just unclick feed. it. Oh, yeah, okay. Just unclick. Got it. Exactly right. All yeah. right, so the, so you're full time chasing uh, bad weather. Yes, I am. Uh, I try to chase whatever I can, and have evolved a little bit now into travel photography, and try to do as much travel type photography as I can. Basically, I shoot what I can, probably just like everybody else here in the chat. Um, of course, storms is my passion, and it was my start. But uh, anything that makes an interesting picture with lots of colors and makes people go wow, I shoot it. Wow. Shoot it right wow. in the face, I bet. Oh, right? yeah, right in the face. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Mike, don't call me Mazul. Tell us a little bit about how you pronounce your name and everything else that's good about you. Uh, you pronounce it Mezuel. Uh, I don't, but you do, apparently. <laughs> I kind of know. Uh, <laughs> originally, but then uh, moved down to Texas and fell in love with the weather. Uh, it scared the uh, living Jesus out of me at first because we don't have that kind of weather in New York and then uh, got hooked on it and started uh, chasing and kind of got into photography at the same time so combined those two and uh, been doing it now for about, uh, about 12 years. 
and uh, focus mainly on tornadoes and severe storms. Uh, unlike Mike, hurricanes scare me, and I can't get away from them, so I haven't <laughs> experienced that yet. But uh, yeah, basically just uh, shoot everything I can, and you know, if there's weather around, I'm I'm either running to a roof or running to the car to go out and shoot. Yep, and as a wild card, we may or may not see your brother streaking across exactly. the background tonight, right? <laughs> Only if you guys are lucky. Yeah, okay, if we get lucky. All right, Kelly DeLay, without any further delay, tell us everything good about you. <laughs> everything good about me, okay. Um, I am a uh, photographer. I live in uh, in Frisco, which is north of Dallas, um, not too far from Curtis and Mike, actually. Um, a, uh, a, a blog, a daily photo blog called clouds365.com that I've been shooting the sky um, every day for the, over the last four years or so. <laughs> um, I, I have a, a passion for uh, storms um, chasing on the plains, uh, uh, it, particularly lightning photography. I've, I've always been enamored at it um, and uh, just absolutely love being out there chasing. So it's, uh, you know, it's what what I do now, uh, I'm shooting the sky and um, being a weather slash environmental photographer. Um, you know, like Mike, I, I shoot pretty much everything, but um, but a lot of my focus is just you know in the in the sky and the weather. So I'm very happy to be here. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. Next. Um, we have uh, Jim Reed, and I was told that by, I think contractually, every time we say Jim Reed, we have to, <laughs> we have to clap, so there you go. I don't want to get sued, but go ahead, Jim, Jim tell us all Jim, about Jim. Jim, can you do your introduction with your cigar in your mouth? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there we go. Right there, so, uh, that's good. <laughs> so I'm officially the only photographer tonight wearing glasses. That's it. <laughs> right. oh, okay. Good introduction, got... Jim. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, uh, I've been documenting our changing climate and uh, a lot of the storms, the record-setting storms, uh, for 22 consecutive years. And uh, what might make me a little different than, than uh, other photographers is that I also photograph ice storms, blizzards, floods. Uh, so it's really, I, I consider myself more a weather photographer than anything else, uh, but in this day and age, if you tell somebody you're a weather photographer, they immediately say, oh, you're a storm chaser. So uh, uh, it's a great well, now, job. Wait, hold on, you got a book right behind you that says storm chasers. Now, what are you, are you denigrating the, the profession? <laughs> what? That was there. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, it's funny. Uh, contractually, the publisher gets the last say on the title. Um, and I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but it, I love my publisher. We had a great time working together, but I really didn't want to call it Storm Chaser. Um, it's nothing against Storm Chasers. I just I would have rather have said something a little bit more like uh, storms or extreme weather or something. But, uh, you know, Storm Chasing has become such a uh, popular, you know, part of our vernacular over the last five years that uh, it seemed only logical on a marketing level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So, are you your full time storm chasing? I am full time. Are, okay, weather photographing. What's the correct? Yeah, term? I mean it, it's it's harder to do than it used to be. Uh, I I liked doing a lot of my own self assignments and then brokering them, but the market has really changed a lot. Um, I like but, to do a little self assignment myself, just to be honest with you. Yeah, it's it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Those are extra long assignments too, aren't they? <laughs> so, wow. But they, uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, it, it, it's hard doing it year after year without taking a break. Uh, but it's also very exciting. You know, I've actually seen our our climate change. So my opinion is just based on what I've witnessed, and and uh, it's been fun doing the books. It, uh, but I especially like teaching and and giving the speeches and going out and. You know, uh, speaking to people out in in the public, it's and, and like this. It's this is a great opportunity. I appreciate being involved. And where do you live? Uh, right now, I'm in Wichita, Kansas. Wichita, Kansas. Okay, so I'm picking up on a theme here. So far, everybody is either in like Tornado Alley territory or down in the Keys, where you're gonna you're gonna get extreme weather. So you guys. I, I'm kind of curious as we go through this is did you guys move to those areas because you wanted to storm chase or were you in those areas and thus you storm chase? 
What would you, I was, what born, would you I was born and raised. I was put in the element myself. All right. And how about you, Mike? Uh, well, I moved from New York, but uh, oh, you moved. All right. So then you I got the... away from here because of the storms. So right. you you got the bug after moving into the area. Yeah. All right. And Kelly. Um, I got the bug being here. I, I was born in um, Graham, Texas, which is just west um, of, of Dallas, <clears throat> and I saw extreme, you know, tornadoes and extreme weather at a very early age, and um, been all up and down the plains. So, you know, it, when when you you're here, you just fall in love with weather. Uh, well, now, were you in the Dallas area when the tornadoes went through downtown Dallas, shattering high-rise building glass and stuff like that? Yeah, that, that came through for, for... It was a very traumatic event. He still can't talk about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> we lost your audio there, and uh, it's saying Fort Worth, although uh, it was a little stressed out. Yeah, all right, all right. So, and Jim... <laughs> Jim, sorry, Jim. It's going to be a good show, folks. I can already tell. Uh, now, did you move into the area, or did you start getting into it because of the area you were in? Uh, I actually grew up in Illinois, which had a lot of different types of weather. Uh, but I lived out in Los Angeles for 10 years. And back in the uh, 80s, the Southern California had very unmemorable weather. It was pretty, pretty you know, uneventful for the most part. Uh, and so I eventually um, had an opportunity to move to Kansas where I began interviewing uh, scientists, tornado researchers, even storm chasers. That was the first time I'd ever heard the term storm chaser and got hooked. Uh, I stayed with it. You moved to Kansas on purpose from L.A.? That's the rumor. All right. <laughs> do, you, do you still feel like that was a good idea? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 amazing how fast the time has gone by. Um, but That's there's uh, nothing else to do in Kansas but look at the clock. Well, it's it's amazing. My, my girlfriend, <laughs> my girlfriend has lived with me for two years, and she's from Boston. Mm. So uh, we have really enjoyed the people here. Uh, I'm not just saying this because I'm in Kansas, but geographically, it is a great place to photograph the sky. There, there are very few trees. You've got the great road networks, north, south, east, west. Uh, and there are a lot of unfamiliar areas of Kansas that are very photogenic that hardly anybody ever talks about, which I love because I love what? shooting stuff that other people don't. It's mainly the mountains, the mountain ranges there that you could really, that are so photogenic, right? <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that we actually have a, a, a 20,000 uh, foot peak yeah. uh, just to the west of Wichita. Yeah, I go skiing a lot in Kansas, so you got to hook up to a truck, but it's still fun. Yeah. So, <laughs> next, hey, Gino, hey, Gino, let's not forget to introduce our... Uh, yes, James, James Brandon. Yeah. Uh, James, uh, we've only got two minutes left in the show. Thanks, so <laughs> No, no, take it easy. What's going Appreciate on? You. Tell us all about the goodness that is James Brandon. Oh, I don't really know why I'm here. Uh, it's mainly because I begged Curtis yes. to, uh, to be in the company of these amazing photographers. Uh, I'm a photographer. I, I do it full time. I've been doing it for four years now. And uh, Mike uh, Manzel in, introduced me to uh, <laughs> storm chasing this past uh, spring. So I've been on three storm chases so far. And I am uh, hooked in every sense of the word. And he found out how much he hates eastern Oklahoma. Yes, yes, so. I did. All right, so cool. cool. Now, where can people, if they want to find out about James Brandon, they go where? Uh, they can find me on Google+, Plus, of course, and I have a website at james-brandon.com. Where did you get that name from? I think that's genius. Uh, you know, it, it took a James lot of research. JamesBrandon.com. It just kind of went with your name? Or? No, not James Brandon. James Dash Brandon. Oh, James Dash Brandon. Uh, Aaron, James. Aaron, that's do all not, the difference. Do not go yeah. to JamesBrandon.com. All right, James Dash. Not underscore, not dot, but dash. Dash. All right, good. Good to Don't know. Do it. Yeah, that, I think that's like going to WhiteHouse.com instead of WhiteHouse.gov, you know, with James. So you just got to be careful where you're surfing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's got to be a good after story with that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so where do we begin? Curtis, you have any big questions uh, for our Yeah, our well, this was, was kind of your baby. This was your yeah. idea to do this show. So, Yeah, I, well, I'd like to, where I'd like to start is just um, we talked about, you know, Gino started talking about where you located and stuff, but maybe the um, a couple of twofold, maybe the why, really, just why would you go out there and do this and chase storms when the rest of us are off waiting till beautiful weather and sunsets? 
and so what what's the attraction for you and then um, maybe even the the whether you feel like the word storm chasing has got uh, hijacked you know a little bit because now everybody and their brother wants to do it where it used to be sort of probably a little bit of a weak group but you, now you what I heard up and happened up in uh, Oklahoma City was there were so many people on the roads trying to take photos with their cameras, camera phones and stuff, it got really scary. So, um, you know, just one of the mics can jump in or whatever you think. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't, I'll go ahead, Mike. Oh, go ahead. I was going say, I, yeah, I don't like the, the direction storm chasing is going as far as the term storm chaser because anybody who gets in a car now and throws their family in the car, they're a storm chaser if they're going after a storm. And that really gives the other guys who have a little bit of experience or a lot of experience, um, it kind of clumps us all in the same group. And it's unfortunate because most storm chasers do have knowledge of what they're doing. They know how to read the sky. They know how to stay safe. And unfortunately, these, um, I don't know if you'd call them uh, just bandwagon storm chasers or whatever, they follow the other storm chasers and they're causing these traffic jams. And El Reno was a great example of how it's, I think it's going to get worse because there's going to be more traffic jams, people stuck in their cars, and you just can't get out of the way. I mean, on the El Reno day, I was actually evaluating which ditch I might have to get in because I was stuck in a traffic jam with a tornado a quarter of a mile away from me. All right, now, um, Mike, for, the, for those who aren't full-time, our, our viewing audience, and for me, let's, let's keep it real, tell me about El Reno day. What is that? El Reno's um, in Oklahoma, and that's, um, geez, what day is that? Uh, the 31st, May 31st. And uh, that was the day that unfortunately claimed the first um, set of storm chasers and great storm chasers. And uh, we all knew that one day this may happen. Of course, it happened to some guys we never thought it would happen to because they were very smart at what they did. Um, but it was a day that it will forever be embedded in my mind because it's one of the only times I've ever actually been scared storm chasing, or at least in tornadoes. And I was just, I felt so small because I couldn't control the situation. I was in a traffic jam. I couldn't go anywhere. And if a tornado would have come our way, a secondary tornado or a satellite tornado, we would have been toast. I mean, we uh, we just had no control at that point. And you're and, and you're saying not not that I'm trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to clarify. This was mostly. Are you saying because of so many people following the storm chasers, kind of bogged the whole road down? Or uh, no, I think that just contributed a little bit. I mean, it was a combination of locals as well that just live there, and then actual storm chasers. But where I'm getting at is is. I don't know. People just tend to now. Oh, I'm a storm chaser because I got in a car and I, you know, I'm going after a storm. But they don't even know what they're looking at. Some of these locals are just people, and there's nothing wrong with it because they have the curiosity and they're just as interested, maybe as all of us are. But I think I wish there was another term. I don't know if you could say expert storm chaser or experienced storm chaser, but we're all just in the same clump now. We're all storm chasers, and it's just there's thousands, of storm, I mean, hundreds of storm chasers now. If you if you consider anybody that goes after a storm, storm chaser. Yeah, I had I had absolutely mm -hmm. no idea how much of a circus it was uh, going into it. And I'll you know I'm gonna you know prop uh, Mike up here because he took me out and showed me how important it was to go with a uh, a veteran, somebody who's been doing it for a long time. And I mean, I got in the car with Mike, and it was like, uh, he, like a data center in his car. He's got like a laptop up with this big screen. It's got double screens inside of it, and they're looking on their cell phones and iPads and tracking down every aspect of the storm. And and I know for a fact, like several people who go out and do this just with their iPhone. And I'm like, yeah. how stupid is that? You know, like I've been only three times now, but I don't know when I'm going to be comfortable enough to go out on my own. And I'm just thankful for you know somebody like Mike who's willing to take me along and, and let me experience it. Jim, what do you think about this? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. I, I lit my cigar and the screen went dead. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I think storm chasing can almost be compared to driving. Anybody can call themselves a driver. But there are skilled drivers, there are responsible drivers, there are people that are uh, very careless. Uh, there are professional drivers. There are people that make a living at driving. So there are different levels of, of the profession. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing now is a, an extreme variation uh, when it comes to storm chasing. It, it's just A to Z. You've got everybody from 
somebody who is trying it for the first time in the family sedan with an iPhone to your tornado researchers and and uh, uh, you know guys and, and women that have been doing it for 20 plus years. So this is kind of an overall question, um, you know, kind of going with what Jim and, and Mike, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like there's a certain level of annoyance, if you will, at all the noobs showing up in the woody with an iPhone following around people that know what they're doing uh, and kind of leeching off of their experience. Is that, is that, am I picking that up right? There's also a, uh, you know, as basically chasers have been doing this for a while, there's kind of like a code of ethics out there that you see guys who've been doing this for years, you know, we know to pull completely off the road, you know, we, we're aware not just of the storm but of the surroundings. You know, we're on the phone with the National Weather Service or 911 kind of relaying what's going on and, you know, what our advice would be to the people that are in the path of these storms. So when you see these guys out there that, you know, I'm not going to judge them whether they're chasing off an iPhone or an old school map or whatnot, but when they have no idea what they're doing and they're cutting people off and there's, uh, you know, all sorts of chaos going on, that's when you kind of like, you know, I don't want to be called just a storm chaser because they're calling themselves storm chasers. So I don't right. know if that's but... It's getting chaotic now. It, it is becoming a circus out there. Absolutely, I agree totally. So, go ahead. No, I agree with what Mike said. I mean, that's uh, it's true. I mean, I don't have anything against anybody going out there because they might have the same passion all of us do. But uh, it's just it's it's a shame that now you know some of the mistakes and things they're doing and and with the local law enforcement now is becoming an issue, and in things that people are doing and they're not always some of storm chasers that are in are in this group they're like you said they're people that just get out you know go out of their house and they follow us or they just see the storm because you can't miss the storm in your face but once you get into the storm these people might not know what to do they might not know there's a rain wrapped tornado and drive right into it and unfortunately we're gonna see more of that I think and it's gonna be a lot of people not only experienced storm chasers but also people who just want to go out there and see something yeah, yeah I, I think two two important events that have happened in recent memory one uh, just you know, what, a month ago in Oklahoma City where you had people motivated to leave their area code to seek shelter, literally get in their cars and try to drive away. Uh, another uh, turning point, I feel, was a couple years ago when there were so many chasers out on the road that Vortex uh, 2 couldn't even complete their scientific goals. Uh, and it got to the point where local law enforcement had to uh, close roads because of these rural traffic jams. So I think it's important to remember, I think, you know, it, it, there are so many drivers out there to begin with. And then you add bad weather and distractions and it becomes very hazardous. So, uh, you know, I, I think through discussions like this, eventually there's going to be some sort of... Um, at least a solution on how to continue. Uh, it may be a sit down, but I, I hope it involves people that have been out in the field as well as as people who are, you know, official. So, what is it? Uh, my original question is of, um, you know, I guess for me, I, I would like to look out the window and see something that would be awe, and, you know, make me an awe. But what is it about this for you all that caused you to spend your dedicate your lives to chasing these things around? Is it the beauty? Is the is it the danger? What is it? Well, for me, it's a for me, it's just the beauty part of it. I I'm not really a thrill seeker. I think there's there's people out there that 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 approach storm chasing as kind of a you know a thrill seeking activity. Um, for me, it it is a um, it's a spiritual um, you know witnessing you know these huge storms, um, the genesis of a storm from the very beginning with blue skies and being able to read maps, you know, reading what the weather's doing um, and just all of it coming together, um, you know, at sunset, it's just a, it's an unbelievable experience. Um, and as a photographer, you know, there, there's so much beauty and movement and motion and color and everything that I want as a photographer, it's satisfying. But the thing is, is once you get some of those images and you get out and start chasing it, I mean, you, you want, you want more of that. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, and there, there's, there's, there's a balance that you have to be well, careful with and chasing. Um, but anyway, for me, it was just beautiful. Yeah. 
Kelly, Kelly and I just had uh, an experience that I think really ranks up there why we do what we do. We were uh, covering severe weather in Kansas, but as the day uh, concluded, we found ourselves in the Gypsum Hills, uh, this wide open, it, it reminds me of like a movie set for a, an old western, and it's, you can see in all directions, and, and the lightning was right over our heads, and the sun was going down, so you had these magentas and these oranges and every hue in between, and, and we're both taking pictures, and then the coyotes start howling, mm -hmm. and uh, you're out there so there, there's a there's a, a very mesmerizing uh, um, combination of, of beauty with serenity, but also the element of um, uh, electricity and power and excitement. So it's a real uh, it's it's a very attractive combination, and I think some people, a lot of people that do it, uh, get get hooked. Yeah, for me, like going out as a as a complete amateur storm chaser this this spring. I, I, you know, I've lived in Dallas Fort Worth my entire life, and we've been around tornadoes, and we've gotten in our closets, you know, growing up, and I had never really experienced a, a, a supercell, like just looking at it. And when Mike drove us out there uh, and got us in front of this massive supercell, I just had no idea how powerful they were. And I'm standing out there in a field with like a 50 mile an hour wind at my back because the storm is just sucking up everything in its path and it's just feeding itself and getting bigger and bigger and uh, that's like the moment that I was just like holy crap like this is this is insane and uh, you know I so I think to a certain extent you know it, it's hard to describe it unless you've actually seen it and, and experienced it I think just kind of how you know everybody else has said before the power of it is pretty amazing but also you know Everybody, we've talked about tornadoes quite a bit. The tornado is its almost like the icing on the cake for me. You know, it's not all about seeing a tornado. If you see it, that's great. But uh, what people don't realize is there's so much more going on besides a tornado. There's, you know, sometimes you get storms that don't even produce a tornado, but they look like an upside-down wedding cake, and it's just absolutely insane. You've never seen it. It looks like something off, like, Independence Day. Or you get storms that produce incredible amounts of uh, cloud ground lightning, you know, or you get storms that just turn all different colors and hues of, you know, in the sky. It's just, there's so much more than what, you know, you're seeing, because, you know, we've got all these storm chaser shows on TV that say, okay, tornado, 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 but there's so much more going on, and, you know, kind of like what James said is, you know, unless you're out there to experience it, you really have no idea. Yeah, well, that's a kind of a nice segue. Some people in the chat room are, are saying, all right, tell these guys we didn't tune into the show to listen to them talk. We want the images. So, uh, and, I, and I'll tell you, the, uh, the most interesting images, when I was uh, looking through all of y'all's web pages today, there, there aren't really tornado images. Right. Um, those, those supercells and the lightning going off and the fields of, you know, hay or wheat or whatever kind of bending over. And, I mean, those are... Those are the shots that are amazing, not necessarily tornado shots. Right. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's good. I'd like for them to share the photos, and then maybe they could explain it as you, as you maybe the, if you recall the situation. But I, I feel like it's a catch-22 because I want you to talk to our audience because we do have a heavy photography audience um, about how to do this safely. So although here in one way we're, we're saying we wish we didn't have some amateurs out there, but another way we're trying to understand how to do it safely if you have a, a professional photographer that wanted to go take a picture for Supercell, how do you get? How do you know that that's there? How do you get ahead of it? How do you do it safely? Well, Maybe you can talk about that while you're showing some of your shots. If I, I'm not ready to show anything yet, but I'd like to add very quickly that one of the best ways to start, in my opinion, if you're interested in the weather and you're interested in photographing it, is uh, go to your local office. Uh, National Weather Service has uh, these spotter talks. And you don't have to be interested in math or science, or but what, what they teach you is is structure and what to look for and what to possibly anticipate. And learn as much about the weather as you can online. There's plenty of resources. Uh, learn as much about your subject as possible. I know some of the best sports shooters out there are really good at what they do, not because they're great photographers, uh, you know, since birth, but because they've learned the sport. They anticipate the players' moves. They they they. You know, they study it. And the more you know, the, the better you can get. And, and I encourage people when I speak to also just start with your own backyard. 
you know, don't don't venture out. Just start with uh, photographing, you know, clouds as they come to you. Uh, and if you live in a, an area in the United States where you've got a change of seasons, you're you're you've got an advantage. Cool. Well, why don't we start um, just in no particular order? We'll just go over here next to Curtis, uh, Mike. We'll, we'll kind of go Mike uh, and then uh, Mike uh, Tice and then Mike Mesuel Kelly. Jim, James, and uh, we'll just start showing some pictures. So, Mike, are you, are you ready to do a little screen sure. share and show us some images? You said to pick our, our favorite 1,000 images, right? That's right. 1,000 okay. is the <laughs> We're not doing more than 1,000 each. Guys. And you, each image, try to take five minutes or less. Okay. All right. All right. So, let me click on uh, full screen, start screen share. Is that correct? Oh, no, um, a double Gino. <laughs> scary. Yeah. yeah, we don't need a double Gino. All right, now you're done. Uh -oh. Uh, can you see? Yeah, that looks good. Lots of lightning okay. cracking everywhere. So here, so here's your lightning. Um, it's not a tornado, of course. And this is one of my favorite lightning images. This was in Kansas, actually very close to where Jim Reed lives. Um, and it's just very colorful, lots of purples. Um, I love the, the way the lights are flaring. Um, this was taken just from the balcony of a day's in after a long day of chasing. Um, I, now give, it, give us the quick lowdown on, on how to capture lightning. I know I see people asking all the time, how do you capture lightning? Okay, uh, we've got to have a tripod. It's got to be still if you don't want it blurry. This one, I believe, is about a 20-second exposure. Um, it, it depends on your surrounding light. I mean, it's not always the same. And what's great about digital versus film is you can take a quick shot, see how the picture comes out with your surrounding light, if it's too much or too little, and you can adjust. And then, of course, the main thing is you just hope you get lucky and something strikes in front of frame. So are um, you just literally sitting there, like, taking shot after shot after shot and waiting for lightning to... Get yeah. captured. In this situation, yeah, a 20 second exposures. Nowadays, they have lightning triggers, which I don't, I still don't own one, um, and that'll snap the second the lightning goes. But I, I prefer doing it this way. Uh, it's just to me, it's challenging. It's fun. It's the way I've always done it. Um, and this is just one of my favorite lightning images um, yeah. in general. And, and were you, it looks like you're using a pretty big f-stop there because you got a little starburst coming off of the light pole. Yeah, I, you know, I should have done some research. I'm not sure what it is, but it, yeah, it's pretty big. Okay. Uh, but uh, now, you know, the other thing is you have to guess if it's a re if you get a very close lightning bolt and you're letting too much light in, it's going to be washed out. You're just going to get a white image or it's not going to look well. Of course, if you know the, the bolt is going to be close, you want to close it quite a bit so you can see all these branches coming off and all these different effects. So there is skill, but there's also a little bit of luck because you're not going to know the exact distance the lightning is. You can kind of gauge it of what the strike before was. Um, but generally, when I do lightning photography, I find myself cursing at nature and at the camera most of the time because the lightning will hit in a certain area and the other area is very active, and the second you move the camera over because you go, oh, this is the area it's going to happen, it happens where you just move the camera. So <laughs> I find myself yep. uh, cursing quite a bit doing lightning photography. Do you do, you do much post on, on shots like that? Much what, sorry? Post production. Yeah, I'll do a little bit. I might uh, bump the contrast up just to make maybe the, the, the lightning pop a little bit more. Um, in this particular one, I think I had to add a bit of sharpening. But that's about it on this one. Um, other ones I might do a little bit more depending on what the, the photo is. Now, but, when I see these shots where they show people with just like, you know, 30 strikes of lightning, that's where they're kind of taking multiple shots and then maybe uh, masking in different lightning bolts? So, it would... Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in this case it's not, but some sometimes that's what people so do. So that was one shot of lightning came down like that? Yep. Yeah, yeah within, wow. within that frame of when, the, when it was open. This Pretty is what cool. happened. Um, but yeah, this is a, a pretty good one. Oh, of course, now I'm talking about tornadoes aren't the main thing. Uh, this one was in South Dakota, and this is a church. And it was the tornado was going from left to right. You could see really good structure. I mean, look at the contrast in the clouds. Uh, you can see different features, um, inflow tails, and all kinds of stuff. And you can see the the green grass is bent over, and that's the winds just sucking into this whole meso, this whole tornado in, in supercell. And I was actually standing in about 80 mile per hour wind, 70 or 80, almost like category one hurricane, basically, kneeling down, using myself as a tripod, my knees and my elbows, and trying to get a steady shot just because just I didn't want it blurry. Um, I thought it may hit that, that building, which is a church. And it eventually passed just behind that church and took out, there's a little outhouse in the back, 
And ironically enough, this is Faith, South Dakota, um, the town of Faith. And this has been a, a, a really big licensor um, with, with religious type uh, you know, uses because of, of it's in faith and it's a church and everything. Um, but, you know, not that there's, I think there's any comment, any uh, correlation, but I just think it's a beautiful photo, green, it's got the, the cloud structure. Um, you know, to me, it's, we're, we're pretty close to this tornado, but it's not about getting close, you know, it's a lot of times when you're further back, you get more of the structure and the things that go with the tornado instead of just a tornado. I mean, there's a million tornado photos. It's all about foreground. What's that? Was that was that in June of 2000? Uh, this was in May. This was in May. Yeah, May, typically May is when I go out there. The month of May for the past 13 years. Now, so now May, here's yeah. a question, and I, I I don't mean to. I hope this question doesn't come across as as uh, rude, but I, I think it's a good question, which uh -huh. is, on the one hand, you're you're out photographing these tornadoes, and you see a little building like this, and you know if the tornado hits it and the building just starts blowing apart, you're gonna get some incredible you know footage off of that how much in, in your heart are you on the one side hoping you get something like that and on the other side saying man I hope it doesn't destroy that church right over there um, of course I'm hoping not I mean we never want them to see structures we never like to see them go to towns or communities uh, and unfortunately they do um, but I think at the moment the really the only thing I'm thinking is my safety and getting and, and say, staying safe and documenting it uh, because regardless of what people think in either way whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen so I, I take more of a I mean of course I lean towards I don't want it to hit anything but for me it's more of a neutral just uh, I feel like I have a job to do and that is document whatever happens and stay safe and then w the good thing about storm chasers if, if it does hit something we're the first ones there we're there before the ambulances we're there before anybody else so there's I can't tell you how many times we've gone and helped and you know tried to lift boards and try to help people and see what we can do to help and call 911 call the tornado report in um, but you know you, you wouldn't be human if you were wishing for uh, you know this to hit that building of course not we, you know uh, we never wish for that can't speak for everybody, but for me, you know, of course not, no. All right, well, fair enough. All right, go ahead. Um, all right, I can only pick five photos, so let me, I put nine in here. Let's go to, here's a, um, a big supercell in Nebraska. You know, I, I got the person standing there for a little bit of scale. It's coming his way. To me, this one really, you know, it's powerful because this guy is just kind of like all inspired you know, what the heck is going on. It's actually a good friend of mine, but... You can um, tell from this distortion, you've got a really super wide-angle lens. Do you know what yeah, kind of lens it was? This one is. It's a um, it's the Canon fisheye. Uh, geez, probably like a fourteen, fifteen. Four, I think, yeah, fifteen. Um, because I'm trying to get as much of it in, the, in there as I can. Um, I I tend to go with fisheye more, and I wish I didn't, but I I like to get the whole thing in there, and and I don't like to put it in Photoshop later and correct it. I like to just kind of leave it how it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's that's a good one. Then we'll go to a hurricane. This is a hurricane in Bermuda, Hurricane Igor. Um, of course, we're we're still talking about storms, but a different storm. This the the beach is actually quite a ways out there mm -hmm. and the storm surge is coming in, but the uh, the colors is what got me, you know, the nice turquoise. It's still turquoise waters even though we're in hurricane force winds and the waves are coming in and it's just, you know, simple shot, single palm tree. Um, I just I really like this shot. Gino, are you seeing the the photo? I lost the photo there. Yeah, no, hey, I've seen it. Hey, Mike, I was wondering, uh, one of the things that I think is really cool that I've learned recently, um, I got my uh, private pilot's license back in January and learned a lot about weather just through that, but could you try to explain to everybody listening what the storm surge is and how it works with pressure and everything? So I think it's pretty sure. cool. Yeah, the storm surge is, is wind-driven. Uh, basically, if you're in the right front quadrant, what happens, that's where the wind comes on shore. So if you're standing on shore, the wind is coming at you, and it's pushing all that water your direction, um, as well as a, a little bit of help from if you have a very low pressure, it almost, there's, almost creates a bit of a bubble in the middle with the combination of the rotating winds. It, <clears throat> And it just rises and brings all that water in, and, and Jim Reed can also attest this as we documented Katrina together, which was the largest storm surge event in, in American history, 28-foot storm surge. Imagine the power behind that to drive the, the water 28 feet high and bring it into the entire, you know, a, a lot of the Gulf Coast area. Um, 
but yeah, it's, and what happens is once that eye makes landfall and the winds change direction and it's not that onshore wind, the water just instantly goes back out to sea and recedes and you no longer will have, you know, you have standing water but you won't have that storm surge. Hmm. <clears throat> um, so that's, like I said, that's Bermuda. Uh, this is Hurricane Dennis in Key West. Um, I love it just because the colors and, the, of course, the truck. Of course, I hate seeing that truck get destroyed. Um, I'm sure that thing is a rusty. It's did probably they give gone. Did a ticket for parking in a handicap spot? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. <laughs> that, that's actually my storm chasing truck. <laughs> and uh, I never parked there. <laughs> that was, yeah, this is pre Dominator days. But um, the, the thing with hurricanes is it's hard to show wind. Like, how in the heck do you show wind with a still photo mm -hmm. unless you're shooting video? And palm trees is one of the things you really have to get because they just show the wind sideways. Um, and this one I got lucky with the truck and the nice, colorful green seagrass coming up with a little bit of storm surge. Uh, you got the blue handicap signs, some colors going on. Um, and one of the things I actually learned like from Jim Reed, I've, which I've learned a lot from Jim Reed with photography, and we agree on the fact that hurricanes are one of the hardest things to document as far as colors, because colors, it, it, which is separate from Tornado Alley, where you got colors from sunset and you just got all kinds of colors. Hurricanes are generally very gray-toned, not lots of colors, gray sky, and it's very hard to make a nice photograph in a hurricane. So I was, I was happy when I saw this particular scene because, you know, there's some good colors going on. Yeah. Those are uh, those are very cool. You're gonna have to watch the previous episode on watermarking, though. It's gonna you can tell us what you think about that. We had a whole okay. episode on on watermarking photos in the last yeah. one. Yeah, we, we it's a good thing we don't have Thomas Hawk here. He just he would be muting you and trying to have us throw you off the show for your watermarks. Yeah. Uh oh, that's an amazing photo. Though. I like the the contrast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's the then, what's the one shot you've got here? It looks like Northern Lights. What is that? Yeah. I put that in there because we are taught, you said send weather photos, so this is a space weather photo. This was recently, this was in the Arctic Circle. Um, I drove up, I flew into a white horse and I had some, some other business to do and then I took some time off and I drove up for a week on my own, just drove north as far as I could, minus 44 degrees Celsius temperatures in this photo. Um, and it was a very minor event as far as there wasn't much activity, but up there it doesn't take much. And this is just a, an incredible northern light show that lasted for several hours. Uh, that's me in the photo. I would, I would put the timer on and I kept running because I wanted to get some scale. I wanted to you know, add more to the photo. Um, but look at the stars. I mean, it was just, there's no light pollution, of course, up there. It's pitch dark. That's the Arctic Circle sign there. Um, most people take their picture next to it, but in the summertime, not in this time of year. Um, but probably my the most I've ever been connected with nature on a personal level, one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe it's because I was alone, and it was just, I don't know, I had this connection that night. It was just totally amazing. Might have been the Crown Royal. Yeah, so what well, was, this, 30, was that about a 30-second exposure there? Uh, yes, it is, yeah. Good now, I've, I've never seen the Northern Lights, but I've heard that in person they're not quite that vivid, but only through the time lapse so you get that much of the color cool. in the shot. I'll tell you what, um, I saw them first when I was much further south a week, the week before. And I saw them and I was not impressed because all it looked like was city lights on the horizon. They were white, there was no color. But in the long exposure, it came out green. And I thought, oh man, that's, I feel like I got robbed almost because visually I wanted to see it. This looked that green in that mm. purple. But the only thing that is different by having a, a longer exposure is the green area, it's in a bigger area where if I would have done a, a faster exposure, you, it wouldn't have covered such an area. But but honest to God, it was that green. I mean, it was cool. just glowing green. And you could see, you know, the snow's reflecting green and everything below it. Yeah. Um, and it really, yeah, it really did look and like is, that. And is that the uh, the Dominator headlights are shining on the sign there? Yeah. Well, that's the old truck. It's been restored. I uh, okay. I actually brought it up there. Excellent. Uh, is that my five? That's five, right? No, you got, if you got good stuff, keep going. What uh, else do you got? Okay, I'll just... Well, I want to make right sure here. we got time for everybody. To yeah, I'll about. be quick. And then back to colors. You got some Who cares colors about everybody here. else? Great yeah. colors. Sunset. This is in Colorado in the Campo Day that produced a beautiful tornado. But to me, this was almost... Well, Campo was pretty beautiful, but this was a good, good scene. Um, again, I like to put people in the shots to show the power of just, you know, man versus nature, how little we really are when these events are coming. 
Um, and then uh, this is a hurricane in uh, Mexico on the west coast. And the reason I put this shot and I actually left this edge in here was to show that the wind was so strong at this moment. I'm in a stairway, and all I did was peek my head out long enough to, and this is handheld, and it's about a, a three or four second exposure. And this hurricane was so dangerous, Hurricane Hova, that I couldn't. Normally, I like to be further out in it, and all I did was just li literally snap this photo. But you can see the trees blowing, uh, and it just kind of has that nice look and orange glowing off the, the lights that are there. Oh, uh, and I think that's my time. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. Let's okay. jump over to Mike. Man, I don't know how to follow that up, but. Uh... All right, let me see if I can screen share the screen share thing. Hold on. Uh, and by the way, Mike and I almost teamed up and went to Antarctica, didn't we? Yes, almost. <laughs> on that competition. Next time we're going to get it. So now to now when you when you get off screen share, click on the screen share button so you stop showing everything. There we go. All right. So Mike, go ahead. Mizuel. This okay. is great. This is uh this is Quanta, Texas this year, uh, which is up in the Texas Panhandle, and uh, I don't know, I just like the shot. It's uh, super wide. I think it's a 14 millimeter, and uh, it goes to show that you know I was talking about earlier that you don't have to have a tornado in the scene to make a great shot, and uh, uh, just like the lines in it, the uh, the contrast between the sky that was kind of had this bluish purple hue to it, and the uh, the green field there. And then uh, underneath there, you can see what's uh, the beginning stages of what's called a shelf cloud. And when a storm becomes kind of, it's called outflow dominant, starts blowing winds away from the storm, uh, you can sometimes get that. And if you look right under that, you can actually see some blowing dirt being kicked up. And then, of course, the, uh, the cloud ground lightning strike was a nice little touch there. So I just like it just because, like I said, it's not a tornadic storm, but it's still got a lot of beauty to it. And now, is, get, is getting the lightning in there just kind of a little serendipity, or, or was that just you clicking away and one of them got lightning? Um, I was actually doing a, a time lapse, and so just got lucky on one of them. So, How that, long was your time lapse? Because that, that, it looks like you're, what, around sunset-ish? Yeah, I think we're about still about an hour away from sunset, actually. So, so we, you, could, you couldn't have left it open for too long. No, but I I usually shoot this with a 10-stop uh, ND filter on. Ah, look at you. So, uh, I had that on, which gave me, in all honesty, I think it gave me, I was shooting probably around F-18. Uh, it gave me about a two-second, maybe so, exposure at ISO 50. And so, what gear are you using, or what camera? Uh, this was at the Nikon D800 and the 14-24 to and it's Come in the on. That's what I use right there. You know all, all real photographers use. The Nikon D800, the 14 to 20. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Canon. Canon. <laughs> Brutal. It's, uh, but yeah, it's one of, one of my favorite shots from this year. Uh, I thought I recognized the super high quality of the camera. But go ahead. Hey, you, know, see, you know your stuff. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a photographer at all behind the camera. No, no, no. You have a good camera, you don't have to know what you're doing. <laughs> wall shot with my iPhone. Um, now this oh, is beautiful. Um, like I said, it goes to show you that not all the action is about a tornado, and um, this is actually behind a storm. These are called mammatus clouds, and uh, sometimes they're, uh, you know, they show up to the party and give you a nice little uh, sunset. And uh, I found this spot it's out near Throckmorton, kind of close to where uh, Kelly was born, um, and just happened to be at sunset. The sky filled up from north to south with them, and uh, thanks for that. <laughs> and uh, just How romantic. Hopped up on the. Uh, uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> now, am I wrong, in, or am I just pronouncing it wrong that those are those are mammulus? <laughs> How do you say it? Mama. Mama. They're not mammaries. They're mammaries. Mammary. <laughs> well, no, no. I'm, you guys, no, you guys can laugh all you want, but if you actually look yeah. it up, the origin of that cloud was from mammaries because they look like breasts, and I'm yeah. not making that up. Yeah, you call them blue clouds too. Uh, yeah, you can you can look that up because I actually I've had uh, they're pretty rare to see cloud formations like that down here in Austin, but I've actually got it two or three times where we had those kind of clouds. So I went and looked them up just to see. Wait a minute, who's talking behind Mike? Jim, who is that? Hi, Sorry. Jenna. J Jenna is photo by that, That's Jenna Blum, um, Hi, my my girlfriend and Hi, author. So, your girlfriend and daughter? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> West Virginia. What did you just say? Uh, that's why I moved to Kansas. There you go. <laughs> okay, on that note, I'm, I'm leaving. All right. All right. Yeah, Anybody she, photo she bombs? Probably a milkshake. Them. There you go. Well, if, if you walk into a hangout, you're going to get called out. So. Oh. Okay, that was the worst. Can, can you hear him? That was like the worst Google Plus bomb ever. Oh, no, it's there. great. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, Mike. Okay, go go ahead. Ahead. Sorry, Mike. She brought you a milkshake? But Yeah. So, wait, so you're, you're, you're uh, I'm trying to do everything I can to eat healthy over here. You're smoking a stogie. <laughs> you're drinking a milkshake. <laughs> What the heck's going on Nathan, out there? Nathan's daughter. He's like the Hemingway of Sturgeon. Yes. You just call me the Hemingway of Sturgeon. I have seen that before. All right. Oh, anyway, shit. back to Sorry. Mike Mezguel. Oh. <laughs> uh, did, did we clarify that that's uh, not Jim's daughter? <laughs> I think it is, Jim. So this is it's more interesting if we leave it that way. <laughs> Uh, All right, take it away, uh, Mike. My Botox. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike. Um, uh, no, you're good. Uh, total loss of thought now, but uh, you can have my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I just liked it because you know it shows a different part of the storm. I like the leading lines into it. You got this nice road that's uh, still wet from the rain, so it gave a nice little glow to it. And uh, yeah, just I like to shoot panoramics as well. So this was, I think, uh, seven or eight. Vertical images, probably. I think it was around 24 millimeters uh, stitched together. And uh, wow, no, I don't. That's a really nice stitch. Moving, if the storms are moving fast, isn't that that's pretty challenging, then? Yeah, I, I've learned to shoot really quickly though while we're out chasing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just another part of the storm, and uh, yeah. So I, I have to say, Mike, you've got some really nice processing skills too. So because that's a, both of both these pictures you've shown so far are really really well processed. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I really actually hate post-processing, processing, so I, I'm usually in there maybe about five, seven minutes tops. Um, I usually do a little bit of uh, curves and levels, mm -hmm. uh, take out any sort of debris. Like this shot had a, uh, I think it was a Whataburger uh, wrapper <laughs> right in the middle of the road, so I didn't want that. Uh, clean it up. You probably left it there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, that was unethical. Nice segue. Nice. But uh, <laughs> and, uh, I think this next shot, Mike was talking about uh, stacking images of lightning, and this was uh, actually only three shots wow. that were stacked together, and uh, I was shooting from the uh, top part of a parking garage. With a uh, 70 to 200 lens, I think this was right around 150 millimeters or so. And uh, is that just, Oklahoma City? Huh? Is that Oklahoma City or where is that? No, that's uh, Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. That's their uh, their dorms. Yeah, I've done a lot of work at the Texas Women's University. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, I do, a, I do a lot of charity work, guys. Gino's, Gino's had his long long lens out there. So. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I don't I'll, know what that I'll means. I'll let that one go. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Anyway, Mike, go ahead. But yeah, it's a, it's just a it's a stack of uh, three images that I believe they're thirty seconds each. And uh, this was probably one of those oh crap moments because when I shot this, uh, you know, I was sitting myself going, all right, those are pretty close. Those are pretty close. And then the uh, parking garage that I was standing on top of got hit, and uh, you know, made me jump back in my car. And luckily, they have lightning rods up there, so uh, you know, it's just one of those come to Jesus moments. And uh, but I got the shot and uh, just love it. You know, I know it's not you know really how the sky looked, but over time it kind of was. So uh, <laughs> I don't I don't do this you know with every lightning image, but it's a kind of a, kind of a cool compilation. Uh, compilation. Sure. So, similar similar technique as mentioned earlier. You're just firing away and looking at it later, or what? To yeah, I mean, uh, as Mike mentioned earlier, you kind of. <laughs> <laughs> You can kind of pinpoint where the lightning is or where the higher activity is, so you just kind of aim there and hope. And uh, I got lucky, of course. Like I said, you know, one of those bolts did strike where I was, so it doesn't show that they're all, you know, right there. But uh, yeah, that's that, that one. And then this was uh, this is my pride and joy from this year. Mm. This is uh, Booker, Texas. Um, we actually were on a uh, – I participate in a research project called Hailstone, and this was the third year that I was out there with them in – we focus primarily on uh, logging hail size and uh, correlation to uh, radar observations. But, uh, 
you know, you were not necessarily in the most photogenic spots of the storm, but we actually called what's called cord punching, or did what's called cord punching, and we came through this massive core you can see on the right side, right hand side of the frame there, and popped out to see this. And uh, yeah, I needed to pull over bad and, and shoot this. And this is another. This is I think a six image uh, vertical panoramic. And uh, we were experiencing at this time about 80 mile an hour winds and uh, almost almost tennis uh, tennis ball size hail. Um, but I just love it just because of the color. Uh, the sun was peeking out behind the rain curtain there, so it lit up a nice orange. You can still see some of the blue sky there. And so just, if, if if you're shooting with the 14 uh, millimeter, which I'm assuming you had it on 14 if you're using the 14 to 24. Um, and you took six shots to get the entire shot in. How? I mean, was this like a 180 degree view right here? Yeah, this is this is pretty close to 180 degrees. Uh, if you're looking on the right side of the frame, that's pretty much northwest. And then if you're looking on the left side of the frame, you're looking almost uh, almost due south there, maybe a little bit uh, southeast. So yeah, you're seeing close to 180 degrees. But this is also kind of what they call a textbook supercell. If you have your rain on, and hail on the right hand side. You got your updraft and rain through base right there in front of you. So this is as good as it gets. Is it explain those clouds that are uh, on the bottom there, Mike, for all those um, Those are, okay, those, those little clouds that look like they're just pieces of cloud, those are actually called scud cloud. And what they do is they, uh, they, they rise up into the updraft right there. And if you have a uh, pretty significant supercell, they'll help create what's called a wall cloud, which then develops your funnel and eventually a tornado and that's what was going on here we did get a brief tornado a few minutes later but if you look on the right hand side of the frame you can kinda of see how that rains blowing almost right to left what happened is that undercut the storm cooled it off and then pretty much ended any chance for a tornado so orient me the newbie here like which, your, which direction the center of the photo is which direction that's you, and is, and is that also the Typical direction? Are you are you in front of a storm or behind the storm? Or oh, uh, that's looking due west, and this storm was actually moving east southeast. So typically, you get your best contrast uh, just uh, north northeast of the storm, but you're also in pretty much the da most dangerous spot um, if a storm is moving uh, east northeast, which they usually do. But this one was actually getting caught by front, so it started moving south, which. You know, it was good for us because we got into the large hail, which we were doing for research. But most of the time, this is one of those spots where you get a great view, but you have to move pretty quickly and be on your toes. But typically, you want to be southeast. Is that right? Yeah, southeast is also another good place to be. It gives you a good, uh, good opportunity to escape if you need to. You just drop south or all west. So, and then, uh, yeah. And I uh, got one more, and back to the tornadoes. This was... Uh, Chickasha 2011, I think it was, May 24th, something like that. Um, that is one crazy dude in the uh, tow truck. Uh, wow. And I'm jealous of his view. But uh, this actually, this was the beginnings of what ended up being an EF4 tornado. And uh, probably one of the most, uh, besides, we were on the Joplin tornado, but besides that, this is one of those tornadoes that grew as quick as, you know, you blink and it's, it's huge, you know. Probably about a minute after this, the storm. This tornado was about three quarters of a mile wide, um, and uh, just you know, unfortunately, you know, I think uh, somebody popped the question earlier to Mike. You know, do you wish to see things get hit? Um, no, you don't. But my kind of thought process process is, if you know, whether I wish it or not, it's out of my control. If it happens, I'm going to be there to shoot it, and. Uh, you know, this something got hit. I believe is is a uh, is a home. So that's what all the debris is in the air. Um, and you know, unfortunately, this is part of storm chasing. You see this kind of stuff. You see where it affects people lot people's lives and property. And uh, you know, I don't want to say I like this photo because of that, but in a way, I do because it does show the realistic side. You know, it's not all pretty. And you know, at this point, we did stop chasing uh, to render aid, and that's kind of one of the things that we do is. If you ever see a storm that causes damage or injuries, you know, you, you know, life and safety is first. So we're helping out. We're all a lot of people I chase with, including myself, are first responder trained and CPR and all that. Cool. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear all of that because that's stuff that you know you don't really know as somebody that's just you know watching uh, shows like this or or TV shows where they're showing all these storm chasers. You don't really get that side of the story. You know, uh, the first responder, first aid, CPR, all of that stuff. 
Yeah, and that's, I've never heard that before. Yeah, and you know that's also in a way kind of you know going back to the whole storm chaser talk. Talk, you know, there's a lot of chasers, new chasers out there that all honestly won't stop. You know, they're all about getting video and and getting close, and you know, it's sad that they don't help. But then you see a lot of uh, chasers that do. So, right, These are amazing. Very, very powerful photo, Mike. I like that's. Like you said, it's realistic. That shows you the reality. It's not all beauty, and and this mm -hmm. does show the other side. Um, good photo. How Thank often, you. how often do you guys run across, you know, like Helen Hunt or you know, some of those <laughs> people out there? We've got cows. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that kind. Of, when you see that movie, uh, how how just ridiculous is it, or how realistic is that? <laughs> I can't believe we haven't seen a Sharknado picture yet. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. No, but seriously, when you watch that movie, is there, is there elements of that that you're like, yeah, that's pretty realistic, or is just like the whole thing you're like, that's just ridiculous? Of Sharknado? No, 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 oh, not Sharknado. Twister. Everybody knows that's real. Twister. The movie Twister. <laughs> Twister, yeah. Uh, some elements are real, but most of it's pretty Hollywood, I think. We do blow out tires. Well, that's true, yeah. But sometimes we strap ourselves to poles with belts with F5s going over top and sort of yeah. five. But I, I would, I would uh, politely argue that uh, some of the personalities in the movie Twister are replicated in the real world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So you, you have a lot of fat guys eating cheeseburgers that are driving and talking <laughs> nerd talk while there's real photographers there. Uh, uh, yeah. About the size of hail. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, there's a lot of the chasers that have close to the speakers up on top of their vehicles. They're so decked out now. You might as well have the da 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 da. Driving down the road. So. Well, cool. Well, Kelly, show us. Are uh, you ready to show us some of your work? Yes. Uh, let me see. It's it's not a trick out. question. By the way, the audience is uh, the que We've had more comments about the awesome nature of the photos than we do questions almost. So everybody's quite right. impressed. Yeah, I knew these were going to be good when I was going through them earlier. I was like, man, these are awesome. Um, so this is a shot that I took a few years ago in, uh, in Phillips, South Dakota. This Ooh. is a, uh, it was a supercell for, an, uh, for about an hour, and this turned into a, um, it's a very HP, a very high base storm um, right on the edge of the Badlands. Um, uh, before I get into this, there was something that, um, Jim was talking about earlier about um, you know for for amateurs going and learning as much as they can about um, storms if they're interested in it. Um, another good way is going out on on a uh, tour group. Um, there there's a few really good reputable groups out there, and this one happened to be with, uh, with I have some friends from Tippus Tours that uh, you know Jim and I have been out with, and this was. Uh, uh, there was there was eight of us that went up to, to South Dakota and we had been out for several days and we got on this storm on June 30th um, of 2012 and the particular day that we were coming out um, I'll, I'll tell you how it was shot in, in just a, just a minute but there were fires that were coming up from Colorado um, which is pretty uh, normal this time of year and it, it the, the atmosphere was very thick with haze, and it, this is one of those fortuitous times in, in, in photography that you, we had the storm coming up, it was bearing down on us pretty quickly, we didn't have a whole lot of time, and when we pulled over um, to be able to set up and get the shot, um, then the, the sun started coming out, and, you know, it started glowing yellow, uh, you know, down on the right-hand side, and lightning was coming everywhere out of the top, and a pretty massive CG hitting it, and it was just one of those moments that I set up. I probably took um, 12, 15 shots, and I had exactly um, what I wanted. Um, so this is this particular shot is a long. It, it was I was using f16. Um, the storm was actually pretty close. The lightning was it was a combination of CG cloud to ground lightning, but it was also arc. Um, arc. You can see it. That, that coming out of the top, it actually hit power lines that were close to us. You could hear the power lines buzzing um, after I took this one. 
Um, but I, I wanted, it was a long exposure, um, well, relatively long for F16. It was about 15 seconds. Um, and as soon as I, I had it on bulb mode, so I was opening up the, the shutter and releasing it as soon as the lightning flashed. Um, so this was one of my, my favorite ones from the, the last couple of years. Probably um, like around using your lowest with, ISO possible? Uh, yeah, I, I think I had it at uh, three or 400 at the time. Um, you know, I wanted some of the color and the richness to be able to come out and, you know, shooting it raw to help me bring out some of the foreground too, because that was part of the beauty of the shot, just the subtle road and, you know, the, the badlands in the background and just the texture of this was, uh, uh, made it important to be able to get it as clear as possible and with little noise. That's one of my favorites of yours, Kelly. Thanks, man. Um, this this one is uh, this one's called uh, these are anvil crawlers. Wow. Um, so to give you a perspective on this particular shot, this is shot at um, this is 16 millimeter. This is one frame. Um, the storm itself was probably um, seven eight miles away from from where I was. Um, this, when it flashed, it came directly over my head. And the exposure itself, you know, la lasted a good, I, I hold it down similar to uh, what Mike was talking about. I, I like to, to feel the pulse of a storm and actually have my finger on a, on an intervalometer um, or, you know, a remote trigger to be able to open and close the shutter um, when I want to. So as soon as um, this one flashed, I held it down, um, I think close to five, six seconds. And that's how long it took for it to, to strike and to crawl up over my head. So, you know, those are one of those, those moments that, you know, specializing in photography and going out and wanting to shoot this. I mean, that was one of the, the ones that I, that I absolutely loved. Beautiful shot, um, Kelly. It's very difficult to get uh, the bolts that sharp. That, that's really nicely captured. You left him speechless with your phrase. Five, six, <laughs> and uh, sorry, I'm a, I, I have I'm a little time, so <laughs> everybody that knows me knows I'm uh, okay. <laughs> um, so. He mentioned Throckmorton a little while ago. I don't, I don't know why. Mike likes to give me a hard time. Um, th this was a storm that um, I was having, we were having trouble um, getting the right, uh, off in the background where the car was driving past, um, we were getting lots of um, noise, light pollution from Throckmorton. And right before this frame, um, the lightning struck, knocked out. The uh, the power knocked his voice out. Yeah, knocked his mic off. Power to, to Rock Morton ground. Then it you know it, it allowed being able to do a longer exposure without it being and getting some definition in the uh, um, and and the supercell coming towards us and you know getting nice clear lightning shots. Um, this one was uh, this was um, April um, earlier this year. Um, stop me if I, I'm just kind of going through some and of Kelly, you I, shoot, I probably picked way too many. You shoot Canon, is that right? Yes, I'm, I'm, a, five, I'm a 5D, so sorry. There's a, on. always the gearheads on the chat forums that want to know. So Yeah, I shoot 5D Mark III. Um, I shoot um, a Mark II for um, when I'm doing any uh, 70, using my 70 to 200, I use the Mark II. Um, and then the Mark III, I, I have the 16 to 35. I use for most of my shots. You wish you had that 14 to 24, but you can't have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wish I do. Especially on like this one. Here's a good example of like Woo! stitching, and you know, I, I use a 35 to 105. So this is actually this is 15 images stitched. Mm. So this is a little past 180. Um, this was in uh, Nest uh, Nest City. Um, Kansas a little uh, earlier this year. That is insane. Um, yeah, just the, the the shelf it coming towards us, and you know, I left in the van. Um, 
on, on the right, the guys that I was with, Tempest, Tempest, just to show the scale of this thing. Is, so what, is that called something particular? Or is that just a, is that a supercell, or what are we looking at? Yeah, this is a supercell that's starting to shelf out. They um, call those motherships, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't... It, this one is not as wrapped up as tightly, you know, as round as um, you know, as a traditional like a staked, um, stacked, like Mike uh, was saying earlier, like a looks like a cake. I mean, this more has a shelf. You know, I couldn't get the whole, the the whole outflow of the storm to the right past the van. Uh, you know, it went on for probably a, um, another, you know, several miles uh, to my right. Um, I, I wanted to be Jeez. able to focus. On you know getting as much as it, as I could in there, but this was pretty much at 180 degrees. Uh, um, so the this same storm um, later later in the day um, in tight, um, you know, showing the, uh, the the detail of the the light coming through um, at sunset and some of the uh, the the fields in Kansas. Um, you know, I know why Jim lives there. It's probably one of the most beautiful places in the uh, on the plains to to photograph storms and, and watch them. Um, the elevation, the light, and um, particularly in you know late spring, it's it's just a great place to be. <laughs> what what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, uh. Let me see. Oh, he was talking. Um, Jim mentioned earlier about the the, the Gypsum Hills. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is coming up. Okay, oh. I'm having technical issues. All right. Well, you, you kind of sounded like a little Cylon Battlestar Galactica there on a few of those, but but it was the pictures were epic. Now, how often when you go out shooting, do you get something of the quality? And maybe this is for everybody, but. I mean, how often do you go out where you get those kind of images that you know, wow, that's a keeper? Is that every trip out you're going to get something good like that? If you hit a good storm and you're going to get something good? If your head's on a swivel, you can find something good. If you get a storm, there's always something going on. But, I mean, yeah. to get the real, real, you know, the humdingers like that, you got you to get a little bit lucky, too. So is that like a one, one, two, or three times a year you're going to run into a cell like that? Uh, this year, I, I had better luck this year of any year with structure of storms. I mean, it seems like every chase that went on, there was some sort of great structure. But yeah. I didn't really see any good tornadoes this year. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, you can't really say, you know, you go out every chase and see something like that, or you could go out 20 times in a row and see blue skies. Hmm. Sure. I think it depends how much time you put into. If you're out, if you just yeah. have a week to go out there and shoot, or if you have all month, you could go one year. You could go out in a pattern that's very low for storms, and you won't get any photos you're happy with. Or other years, you get a bunch. So it's it just depends on the weather pattern, and if you're in the right place at the right time. All right. Yeah. So it's just like real photography. You don't always right. get anything interesting. Nope. All right. All right. So. Um, Jim. Yeah. Let's get over to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe and maybe while you're talking about your photos, we'll hear about your uh, your health food diet that you're on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Very yeah. good. All right. So I'm looking for the. Oh, I see. I'm switching over now. I wanted to say too that uh, I really appreciate uh, you know being with this group tonight because uh, Mike Tyson and I have been out working together a number of times. Uh, I consider him one of the best in the business and uh, I think his best days are ahead of him. Uh, Mike uh, Mezuel, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, I, I thought you sounded familiar. Now I know why I, I recognized your name. I have a folder that I keep of shots that I didn't take but wish I had and uh, you're included in that. You, you consistently mm -hmm. produce excellent work. And uh, what you showed tonight were a couple of good examples. And uh, James, I'm not as familiar with your work, uh, but uh, I have to say I, I, I envy you for just getting started because uh, I remember like it was yesterday. And, man, 
you're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, adventure and and incredible experiences waiting for you. Yeah, I feel like Mike kind of just dangled it out in front of me this season <laughs> and and took it away. So I'll have to wait. All right, so let me get this going here. And there we go. I'm just going to take this right off of my uh, website. <laughs> I heard the crickets. Thank you very much. I'm getting there. Can, now, can you see the website? Yes. All right. So you're seeing what I'm seeing. Yes. Um, and, and by the way, you had asked this earlier, and I'll, I'll, I'll belatedly acknowledge it now. Uh, <laughs> anybody that wants to visit my website, it's jimreedphoto.com, jimreedphoto.com. And the reason I mention this is I, I created a links page just for tonight's um, Hangout, and it's got a link to uh, tips on photographing lightning that I wrote about for uh, Nikon's Learn and Explore page. I've got images on CNN's uh, photo blog, and there are a couple other helpful links. Cool. So, uh, now Real yeah. quick, uh, Jim, before you get started, is there any way that you can uh, get that a little bigger? Because it's that's a, like half the size of the screen is what we're seeing right now. You're only seeing half that, okay. Yeah, is there any way that you can make that a little larger? Maybe not. Does that do there it? There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It, might, it might make them a little pixelated, but does that help? Yeah, that's very good right there. Okay. Um, all right, so this was shot back, uh, I believe, in uh, the first week of May of this year. And you mentioned earlier about, or somebody mentioned about, uh, structure, and it doesn't always have to be a tornado for it to be uh, very exciting and, and, and uh, pleasurable. Uh, this is a great example. Uh, this was a severe thunderstorm in eastern New Mexico. One thing I'd like to mention as well is a lot of early or, or younger chasers with less experience get really fixated on those moderate risk days, those high risk days. Well, I shot this on a day where there wasn't even a C-text. Uh, this this was in uh, eventually they they did uh, the storm prediction center uh, circled this because it became a, a super cell thunderstorm, but um, uh, again good contrast. I, I look for shapes. I look for contrast, colors, uh, movement, and in this you've got a little bit of everything. Um, I really haven't. Uh, this is Jenna who you met kind of informally while ago that brought me the milkshake. Uh, it doesn't always have to be even a, a you know a traditional storm. I try to shoot things these days where you, we haven't seen it a million one times before. And this was an explosive thunderstorm back in April in Kansas, and she was very excited. It was our first chase. Uh, she just had to be jumping up and down and, and having a good time. And and I thought, wow, this is a really cool opportunity as well. So I snapped that. I love the dirt coming off the ground from her jumping. Thank you. I, it's the <laughs> subtleties that that uh, I also you know consider challenging. Uh, on a much different note, since I, I said I shoot different seasons, uh, this is a snowstorm in uh, actually here in Wichita back in February. And this is a, a gargantuan statue of Jesus on top of a mortuary in, in western uh, Wichita. And I just thought, you know, it, it's different. I want to shoot something I have not seen over and over. That's uh, it, Now, who is that? That's Eddie Vedder? Or who was that? Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Is that on top of the mountain there? <laughs> yes, that's that's on top of the large mountain. But uh, and Mike mentioned the church. And, and all all kidding aside, uh, you know, you see a lot of interesting things about America as well when you're traveling. You know, from North Dakota to Texas and 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 from Colorado to uh, Kentucky, uh, you really get a sense for uh, you know the the, the styles, uh, the beliefs. Uh, the roadside diners, and and I find that part equally uh, exciting sometimes. Now, mention tornadoes uh, and lightning. The only way I'm seeing this is th this is lit by lightning. Uh, it's backlit, kind of side lit. Uh, the headlights are from my storm chase vehicle to give the foreground a little bit of of uh, uh, color. It might be a little soft, a little pixelated here because I had to bump up the size of the screen. Sorry about that. But uh, this was also on a storm that took two hours to really get its act together, which uh, is a reminder of how important it is to be patient in this business. But once it got going, it produced uh, a variety of, of tornadoes, different shapes, uh, and for a good hour. Among them, this is the same storm, two on the ground at the same time. Wow. And I was using a D3, an Icon D3, which was... X handles low noise excellently on a tripod, as I think Mike Tice recommended earlier. Um, 
uh, I do tend to use a lightning trigger, which isn't as automatic as, as you might think. It simply opens the shutter uh, when lightning goes off. You still have to set the, uh, uh, the shutter speed, the exposure, you know, your ISO, everything else. And, and lightning's a lot trickier to shoot than, than I think a lot of people realize. The key there is to keep trying. With digital photography today, uh, there's no reason not to just keep shooting and shooting and shooting until you get what you like. Um, I'm trying to pick stuff that others, you were talking about mothership. I would kind of call that kind of mothership-ish. Uh, that's in Colorado. Um, uh, this is a uh, Nikon used this as uh, one of their calendar shots back in 2011. Uh, it's a uh, th this this supercell is beginning to gust out, so that's a, a gust front or a shelf cloud. And then, as somebody mentioned serendipity earlier, uh, the lightning bolt just happened to come out uh, at that time. So you know, but notice the blue in the sky. That's a natural blue. I love shooting at twilight. I love shooting at civil twilight, nautical twilight, and then astronomical twilight, which I talk about in the uh, Nikon Learn and Explore uh, page, uh, it, um, it, you just have this beautiful blue to the sky that the, the eye doesn't always pick up on. So uh, what else? How, how uh, long was that exposure, do you think? Um, because I was using the lightning trigger, I'm guessing it was a third of a second. Ah, wow. I was probably using a, a, an ISO of roughly, I want to say, uh, probably 400 to 650 and and then yeah that the great thing about the lightning trigger is it allows you to keep the shutter open for the least amount of time and if you want to get those really super sharp lightning bolts that helps um, let's see Ooh. See. You know, one thing I really uh, like, I like this shot right here, Oops. and I like this shot. No, no, both yeah. of those. Okay. Uh, the thing I like about them is the same thing, and it's something that I saw in, in, uh, in all of the other guys, too, is putting something for scale. Because, honestly, in a lot of these images, without the car or a human mm -hmm. in it, you have, it, it, you know, you lose all perspective. But with the car in it, which normally, I'm trying to get things like that car out of the shot. Because right. I'm like, oh, that ugly car, i got to get it out of there. But without the car, this shot has really lost something. Right, that's a great point. And th this particular shot has won uh, quite a few awards. And uh, some of the judges who were kind enough to share their notes with me had said they really like the, um, the scale, as you just mentioned. Also, this is a fairly rare shot, uh, as I'm sure you're, you're, the other photographers know. Because I mean, you, it's not every day you see, th in this case, it's a landspout tornado. It's what we call a non-storm scale tornado, one that's not forming under a wall cloud or a supercell. Nonetheless, it's rotating. It's a true tornado. It's, it's just a lot weaker. But notice the, the shadow of the car. This is front lit by the sun. I was getting a sunburn while I was shooting this. This was not your gloomy, gray, greeny, you know, uh, ominous storm looking kind of day. It was beautiful. And, and then it, 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 it's like had it. It hit this uh, dirt field and stirred up the dirt. Um, now, how far away are you there? You look like you're a quarter mile. Yeah, if if that, it's probably because I this is the one that that some people have seen me run up to, and, and it's actually the Weather Channel's. Uh, I, they've got another show coming out, and uh, I'll explain it in detail. On, on it's on, on Netflix too. Yeah, Netflix and different things. Where I knew it was dying, and so I ran up to it and got a couple of closer shots. The funny thing is, the close shots really aren't as good as this, because if you by running up to it, even though it was an incredible experience, uh, I, I lost scale. And, and so even with a wide-angle lens, it just didn't do it justice. Um, one thing I want to add here real quick, too, is uh, this is different. Um, we, we haven't talked about the other side of this. And while it's very exciting and it's very uh, moving for a lot of us to do this on a regular basis, we have to understand that in addition to the magnificence and the spectacular side, these events can change people's lives. And one thing I've done that I don't hear a lot of other people talking about, not necessarily our, 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 your other guests tonight, but I've been shooting aftermaths for about 20 years. And that's one of the exhibits I'm going to be doing probably in 2014, is, is showing both the beauty side and, and, and the, uh, the disastrous side. And I try to, I've, I've interviewed people for 20 years about what it was like, what they went through, and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, this, just, this was Catoosa, Oklahoma back in uh, 1993. Uh, some of your other well, guys may not a, have been born. Yeah, I'm from uh, Claremore, Oklahoma. <laughs> So that's not far. So yeah. let me. Here's a here's a question, kind of the same theme as my earlier question, which is the same vein, but in, from a different perspective. Um, where where do you draw the line on photographing? I mean, do you ever feel like when you're 
going through a town like this and the houses are destroyed, there's people out there. Like, I just can't take pictures right here. It's inappropriate. Yeah, that, that is a great question. And, and everybody uh, watching or listening should consider that, especially if, if they're planning on chasing. Um, you know, first, I, I like the fact that, that, that Mike is uh, uh, trained in first responding. Uh, I'm trained in first aid, and I've rendered first aid. Uh, it's not my, my wish or my hope, but I would say if you're in a situation where this was a, I believe, an F3 tornado, and you know people are either trapped or hurt, the bottom line is if they need your assistance, if they need assistance, I, I think it's a moral obligation to stop and to help first. Uh, I, I find that most people I've encountered are very welcoming and, and as long as you don't just rush up to them and start taking pictures but you ease into it and you ask permission, uh, they'll give you a tour. They want their picture taken. They want this documented because this is something that has changed their life. And, and so if you're, if you're uh, polite about it, if you're respectful, and, you know, it, it usually goes well. Uh, it's easier sometimes when I'm working on assignment and I can say I'm, I'm here on behalf of the New York Times or I'm, I'm, I'm here on behalf of, of uh, you know, whatever client I'm working for that day. But even then, the two rules I've learned in the 22 years I've done this is you always respect the people's property and the people that you're, you're encountering. And equally important, I don't care how irritated you might be or how obsessed with a certain storm you might be, you always have to obey law enforcement. You, you've got to follow the rules, and if they block the road, you've got to stop. You can try to talk your way through, and sometimes I've been able to do that, and sometimes I haven't, but that's another point I'd like to make. Uh, if I haven't used up all my time here, I was going to show you real quick. This is a camping shot I did that's done well. Uh, mm -hmm. ni nice lightning bolt above it, but I had uh, a person inside the tent. Uh, we, we lit it and, and had them holding like a little portable radar device, so I'm really proud of the lighting. This is really hard to get. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's part skill and part, uh, you know, uh, just luck. Um, and then wrap it up, I was going to show you real quick. Mike was talking about hurricanes and, and how difficult they can be. This is my favorite hurricane photo. I, I worked for years to get this. Uh, this is Hurricane Katrina approaching the southern coast of Mississippi the night before it hit. This is the first outer band. Less than 12 hours after this was shot, the southern coast of Mississippi was decimated. People were killed. This, so you go from this beautiful, magnificent twilight shot to, you know, total destruction. And most hurricanes look more like this, where you have kind of a mo monochromatic look. This one's a little on the noisy side, but it, 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 it's not very picturesque. You might get lucky and you might get brown or, or yellows. This is Hurricane Ike. And the good thing about wow. a shot like this is you're getting the motion. You're, you're shooting it so you can actually get Mike Tice was saying how hard it is to get wind, and that's true. It's also hard to get a sense of the storm surge. And this is part of the surge breaking the seawall in, in um, uh, Galveston, Texas. And I'll land on uh, this shot of Mike uh, during Katrina. That He's hanging on to a sign uh, as we were kind of wrapping up the, hmm. the, the shoot. Um, and I was going to add real quick here, last but not least, uh, it's important for people to understand the risk when they go out and chase. This was our, our hotel uh, that we had chosen very carefully. Uh, I'd been there several times uh, before doing Katrina. This was our first floor before Katrina hit and the storm surge came in, and this is after. Wow. So you get a real sense of the power. And uh, so that's it. Uh, My goodness. Quite amazing. Are, and then I, um, let's see, and then of course that's probably my most uh, seen shot right there. So there you have it. Very nice. Amazing. All right. Well, James, can you follow up with that? Yeah. Follow up? James, uh, can, can you just go ahead and run us through all <laughs> of the shots that, uh, that were your cover shots? Uh, can you show us a question of other people's shots that you're, you admire? Uh, <laughs> really insignificant. <laughs> no, no, no. All there are no insignificant uh, people. Just bad shots. Go ahead. Well, no, no. Remember, he, <laughs> remember, he said he. What, how many, James? How many chases have you been out on? Three. Three. Okay, I'm over five hundred. So Sorry. let's keep this in. Let's keep this in yeah. context. How many years? Uh, one spring. Okay, I've got 22 years. So right. There you plus, go. plus, I mean, Jim's old enough to hey, be your great grandfather. Hey, so. hey, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. He, 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 he was asked about Helen Hunt. I remember Judy Garland. <laughs> <laughs> Those are just excuses, James. Step up. All right. All right. Here, here we go. 
All right, so this is... Can you, ah, can you guys see it? Nice. This is my very first storm. And this was... Uh, how do you pronounce it, Mike? Es Esteline or something? Esteline, Texas. Esteline, Texas. Is that all you got, James? Really? Uh, that's the best I've got. No, so it's really I'd share it first. But um, but yeah, I mean, this was this was my introduction to storm chasing, and we we pulled off the highway here, and Mike was showing me how the the wall cloud was starting to form, and this shot right here, from all the shots that I have, this was as close I think as we got to seeing a tornado, and you can see it starting to, uh, you know, spit something down here, and the reason I was trying to get Mike to explain the uh, the scud earlier was because that was one of the coolest things that I saw. Because these clouds would literally form like right off the ground here, and then they would just start sucking up into the storm, and they would almost like like upside down Tetris kind of. They would just start stacking up, and and hmm. this little cloud formation right here would just get closer and closer to the ground, and the whole thing was rotating. So uh, I just thought that was a really cool shot, and you can see uh, I think this is a an inflow trail right here. I'm still learning this stuff, so. Um, but you can just see how much rain there was, and you know we were completely dry where we were standing. But now, what? Uh, let's get some uh, some nerd talk here on the yep. photography side. What kind of work did you do in post here? Because I love the structure of the cloud. You can see a lot of the detail. Yeah, I've been um, for the past year or so. I've been messing around with a technique called luminosity masking. So it's kind of like you know, you can kind of compare it to H HDR in a way, but you're doing it all in Photoshop. So I'll take um, five to seven different exposures, but I might I might only end up using like two or three of them at the most sometimes. I think this one was was three. And then you just combine them based on the light levels in the scene so you can get all the detail out of it. And it's kind of a time consuming process, but you know, unlike Mike, I actually really enjoy post processing and I can kind of get lost in it and uh, it's just something I really like to do. Yeah. Well that's that's great. I I love that you can see all that detail. And yeah. that's obviously. The, I wish you had the the original to show us, so we could see how much you know your post processing has uh, you know informed this final picture. Um, well, I'm in Lightroom. If you guys want to take a detour real quick, I can. Yeah, see if, see if you can jump over and find you know one of the originals that this came from, because I I think that's always fascinating to see. Here's what I got. Here's what you got after I, all my work. So yeah. Um, Let's see. Now, was that baby in the <laughs> shots, and you just that, passed it out? No. no, that is my son, Isaac. Right. I'd be careful to say, that's incredible post-processing skills. <laughs> you don't even see the baby in the final picture. Where is it? Uh, campaign. Oh, I'm in the wrong year. Let's go to the right year here. All right. That's all right. There's tons of time. Everybody has tons of time in their life. Yeah. Yeah. What else are people going to be doing? <laughs> All right, yeah, I just, so, I'm watching the viewer count just just decrease it by the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, there's I think down, there's still a couple of people watching down. the show. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. So oh, this there we is, go. Yeah, there we so go. These are these are the raw straight out of the camera shots. Um, and as I go through here, it's going to take them a while to load because these are very large. No, that's files, okay. But, yeah, that's all right. But you can even see right here. There's a lot of structure already in that raw file. Yeah. And you can see how the you know the it's really blown out here. And I was for those, of course, I'm getting the detail in the grass and uh, the shadow areas. And and it, but if you look at one of the darker exposures like this one right here, you can see you know how ominous this thing was as well. Yeah. So. Now, at the moment that you were there, did it look more like this in real life, as far as the darkness? Um. Or I'd somewhere say it was in between. Somewhere in between the two, yeah. Because okay. this was a this was a much darker exposure. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. Anyway, you know, I didn't mean to train wreck your flow. You can go back to your. Picture. No, no, that was a good <laughs> idea. So, um, all right. So this is the, the kind of the zoomed out version. And then when Mike, you know, saw that it was trying to spit out a tornado, he made us all get in the car and we zoomed down the highway there. And when we got closer, Tor you, you zoomed down the highway towards the tornado. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's quite clear. <laughs> uh, and this is what we saw when we got to the field where the, uh, you know, the wall cloud was forming over. Mm -hmm. So this was really, uh, this was crazy because we're in the same field that this thing is trying to put a tornado down into. And of course, Mike is talking me all through this and saying like which direction the storm is moving, and he had exit routes on both sides, and he knew exactly where we were going to go if something went wrong. 
and uh, that was really impressive. But I mean, this entire thing was just like a corkscrew. It was just twisting and turning, and and it was crazy because, like I mentioned before, you just had these 40, 50 mile an hour winds at your back, and you're facing the storm, and it's just sucking air into it and getting bigger and bigger. And uh, if I go back to this storm, you can this first shot, you can see how much rain is down here at the bottom. And eventually, um, I guess the rain cut the storm off, and the warm the warm air that was at our back turned cool. And as soon as that happened, uh, Mike was like, well, it's dead. And I kid you not, 10 minutes later, the entire storm vanished. It was just completely gone. Hmm. It was crazy. And um, I guess this uh, this kind of teal color up here at the top, uh, I think that's the hail cord. Or there's this hail in there, and that's what's reflecting that light. Yeah, somebody in the chat room said this looks like that looks like the Olympian gods would be sitting on top of those clouds. <laughs> that's what I was going for. Yes. So this was that same day, um, just later in the day. This was the last storm that we chased down that day. And, I mean, this thing looked like an atomic bomb went off. And if I zoom in here, you can see this wind shear going across. Mm. And that just shows the rotation that's inside of it. And I was, I mean, I've never seen anything like this thing in my life. It was, it, it literally looked like a bomb had exploded out hey, there. Hey, James. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting uh, that that you, you just mentioned that and zoomed in. Mm -hmm. I think this is a wonderful shot. But if I saw this, I would slap like a, a 200 or 300 on my camera and zoom into what you just zoomed into. Get yeah. rid of the other clouds and, and go for it. I mean, you've, you've got this beautiful texture. And, and you man, the power is just gorgeous. I mean, you really captured it. Yeah, and, and, you know, it was my first one, and I was just like, I, I've got to capture it all. I have to get it all in the frame. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, uh, I shot this, yeah, with a 15-millimeter uh, fisheye lens, and then I corrected. A lot of people, you know, never do this, but you can actually correct the fisheye distortion yeah. in, uh, you know, Lightroom or Photoshop and make your horizon straight. And um, even this one was, you know, you had a really strong wind at your back, and you can see the grass here kind of yeah. going towards That's... the storm. Yeah, you can't lose. I mean, it's a great, it's a beautiful shot either way. Can I ask real quick too? How mm -hmm. did you convert it? Did you shoot it as black and white, or did you convert it uh, in post? Yeah, I shot it in color, and then I used Photoshop to convert it to kind of an infrared feel. Did you use Photoshop? Or did you use Lightroom? Mm -hmm. uh, Photoshop. Okay. Yeah, you convert it to black and white, and you can you know pull the blues back in the sky to yeah. you know black, and then yeah, through uh, through some curves and adjustment layers, you can add some more contrast. So. So, so much yeah. detail in these clouds. I, I, I'm glad that you zoomed in on that because yeah, I, um, I wouldn't have been able to notice that wind shear pulled the, back. See, I mean, it's like you could you could crop yeah, that thing wow. ten different ways and get great shots every time. Yeah, and yeah. the luminosity masking that I was mentioning ah, earlier that, that really helped pull out the detail in the clouds because I I was not getting it at first, and I started messing around with some luminosity masks and really uh, adjusting the curves and the levels and stuff and. I just had to mask a bunch of this stuff in selectively uh, to get the detail out of them. Hey, Gino, if I could add real quick, uh, what uh, uh, James, can you put that back up with a closer uh, shot? In. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one thing your audience can do, again, going back to learning about the weather, is um, I'm guessing this day the CAPE was very high, what we call uh, the CAPE, C-A-P-E, which stands for Convective Available Potential Energy. It has to do with the, the dew point, the temperature, and you can learn what your chances are of having something that buoyant looking. That, you know, I kind of, I describe it as the cauliflower look. And I, I just, 22 years later, I never get tired of seeing that. I mean, he really captured that well. That That's just, that's just beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was, and, and just like the other one earlier in the day, this one completely collapsed within minutes and was gone. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that blew me away just as much as actually feeling and, and experiencing the storms is how fast they can disappear. So, um, Pretty sweet. Yeah. So this, uh, this was kind of before I had ever chased down a storm. This was at the Grand Canyon, and there was this uh, shelf cloud forming on the, on the north rim. We were on the south rim. So uh, that was at first light at sunrise. I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, go past that, and this was my third storm chase um, up near Gainesville, Texas. And this was on the same day as the Moore, uh, Oklahoma tornado, actually, which is, you know, pretty surreal because I was with Mike, and 
uh, we were going to go storm chasing right at the beginning of the day, and Mike found out that he had a shoot that he had to do for a client. And I, I mean, I just I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we had gone out earlier, we would have been in more. And um, it's just kind of you know I don't know I, I I thought about that a lot and. We didn't get to even leave the house until maybe 6.30, I think. And we got up to the storm right at sunset. And uh, this hail core was, the, the blue in there is, it was just unbelievable. And the shelf clouds spit out. and uh, We just got some really cool shots that night. And that was, that was pretty much it. After this shot, we headed back to uh, get a bite to eat. And we were getting all the information on the more uh, tornado that was happening. And, finding out all the stuff about the elementary schools and uh, it was a pretty quiet dinner so yeah for many of us that night was very quiet yeah the reality of what can happen and we start hearing about kids and everything that's the other side of storm chasing definitely in storms yeah and and being a brand new father and everything I think you know I was fighting back tears the whole time because it's just it's crazy mm-hmm so. Wow, way to way to end that on a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, hey, we'll go hey, back to oh. that. <laughs> if we had any audience, they're gone now. <laughs> oh, so, boy. all right. Well, let me ask you guys this question. <laughs> hey, do you know I want to? If I may, I want to share one photo of uh, myself, sure. not of a storm, but of. Um, uh, we were talking about the power of it, and um, this is before I even got into photography, but. Um, this was a um, so from Joplin, which people forget, but that was how many people? I think 168 people died at Joplin, yeah. and and uh, so I was just really surprised if you all can see this. Say, you know, what would be in the bottom of your sink, dug into the tree? Yeah. And uh, I, a, I got two two questions. How did that get out of the sink cleanly? Where's the sink, and then how did that get embedded so so closely? Whoa. Hi, uh, Wim. But what's sad about it is actually that tree, where that tree is located, is is here, which is the. This was you know we talked about the effect, but this was the, um, um, home where the senior citizens live, the um, mm. uh, retirement home, and so this was the wheelchairs, and it was just completely gone. So. Um, just it was just incredible to go up there a couple weeks after and to see the devastation. We we served with a um, a church uh, helping with a few homes there, but it was just absolutely crazy how bad it was. So, uh, hey Curtis, yeah, it, it, this is probably asking too much, but I I wish people that are interested in in photographing this excitedly and 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 experiencing the adventure would also go out like you did. Uh, perhaps not necessarily to immediately take pictures, but to volunteer. You know, just go for a day to uh, help pass out meals or to do whatever is needed, because it really is an important part of this to see this firsthand uh, to balance everything out. I mean, there's there's a wonderful side to this, and then there's a a very uh, somber side. And uh, I think when we balance it uh, healthily, uh, you know, it's it's a good thing. Yeah, this is the home we served to help clean up, and I didn't really understand the rules, but the insurance company required them to take all the debris to the curbside, um, and there was no one else. This is full two weeks afterwards, and there's not a single person working on any of these houses, and we were just by ourselves with the homeowner trying to clean this house up, and there was just hundreds of homes. There's no no work being done anywhere, and this was right where it touched down. This was the first homes that were hit and um, uh, you know it was just pretty um, freaky to see you know just you're literally just surfing through their personal belongings trying to help them piece back things together so um, now were, were any of you guys around and uh, not to pick on you Jim but you've been maybe doing it longer than everybody else when the for the uh, Gerald tornado down here just north of Austin went through probably about I 10, 15, no, maybe, maybe 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, it's been quite a while. I remember that because it was also a tornado that didn't look particularly uh, threatening. It was kind of a narrow tornado, if I remember right. And I believe it also moved in a, a peculiar direction. It, it moved yeah. like to the southeast. Yes. And uh, wasn't that 
either an F4 or an F5? Yeah, it was it was an F4 van. It it tore a path for years afterwards. When I when I would drive north up uh, I35 uh, north of Austin, and you'd look over to the left and see Gerald, you could see this huge discolored swath of land um, that it had literally just gone through and tore up the grass and houses. There was nothing left in its wake. It was just, but you could see it because it was a big flat plane rolling down from 30, I-35. You could see the ground just discolored and, dis, and you know disfigured. Uh, and uh, if you didn't know better, you wouldn't know what that was, but that was the path of the tornado. Kelly, do you remember that one? No, I don't. I, I... Well, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, I wasn't in Texas back then. Okay. I believe it was '97, and I think it was actually an F5, if I remember right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but bad. yeah, but uh, that was before I was chasing. You know yeah. that 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 brings up a good point. That is to uh, mention to your viewers that uh, you know sometimes the tornadoes that look the meanest are not the strongest, and sometimes the ones that are actually the most dangerous are wrapped in rain. They're not even photogenic, and that's uh, we're seeing an increasing number of people caught on the interstates and driving into these things when they just really don't need to be. Uh, with today's technology and, war and the warning system is fantastic. You know, the the the, the private and 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 uh, public uh, forecasters are doing a marvelous job of of getting word out. So that that kind of brings me back to all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which was I, what was it? There was three fairly well-known storm chasers that died uh, recently, correct? Yes. Yeah, very very well-known storm chasers. Yeah, very well. They Weren't they with National Geographic and a few other... Um, they, they were well-known on every level. I mean, uh, Paul's son, I mean, uh, uh, Tim's son, Paul, probably wasn't quite as well-known as Tim himself, but uh, uh, Tim Samaras and, and Carl Young were known because of their role, their roles on the, the Discovery Channel's uh, Storm Chaser show. Uh, Tim was very involved with National Geographic. Uh, he was very successful at, at doing a number of scientific projects. He was also beloved in the chasing community. I mean, this this is I, this was a guy who was loved and certainly liked on just about every level. So, without yes. uh, getting too, uh, if you you know, I don't know how comfortable you guys are answering the question, but what so what happened? How how did these guys that were as knowledgeable as them, as experienced and seasoned? How did they end up uh, getting caught off guard to this extent? Um, let me just throw this out real quick. Uh, on my links page, on my website, I included um, an analysis basically that shows you visually what happened. It was, uh, guys, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I believe it was created by Skip Talbot. He's Skip also, Talbot, yeah. Right. He's an accomplished storm chaser, also respected. He did this uh, very detailed analysis that shows the GPS points, uh, where the other chasers were, where Tim and Carl were, where the Weather Channel crew was, and you can watch it. And then he intercuts it with shots of the tornado, uh, uh, shows radar, uh, that link, and, and you can Google it. If you want to Google it, I think it's just uh, uh, El Reno Tornado, Skip Talbot, T-A, uh, let's see, T-A-L, T -A -L the OT, I think, yeah. but it, but you can also go to my uh, jimreedphoto.com. I put it on the uh, the links page, and watch that, and it will show you uh, uh, exactly what happened. But in short, I think this was an unprecedented event with un unprecedented risks, and this really was a milestone uh, uh, that will always be remembered in in in, in uh, storm chasing and and uh, tornado research. So, but if you were just to put it in a nutshell, maybe you can't. Feel free to say I can't if that's the answer. The, the, was it a storm just shifted in such a weird way that they couldn't have foreseen it? Traffic? I mean, what was, yeah. if you I, put a, a pin on it. Mike, you were there. I, yeah, I can't speak for them personally, and I think they're still evaluating the whole thing. But with us, what happened was it started off with, it was a massive mezzo and a massive wall cloud that had smaller tornadoes in it. And what happened was the entire thing filled in instantly, I mean very quickly, to a, about a mile wide tornado. And they're, they're still coming out with the exact numbers, but there's some people saying that it went anywhere from a mile, uh, it went from a mile to 2.6 miles wide in uh, just under a minute. So not only does it have the forward motion of this big tornado coming, but it's expanding at the same time. So you add that mo that movement with the motion of it and I think just people couldn't get out of the way a lot of people because the traffic again 
Uh, and again, I can't speak for Tim and crew what happened to them, but I know with us, um, it expanded so quickly, and at the last minute, it hooked off to the north. And not that that's unexpected. People who are a bit more experienced know that that does happen towards the end sometimes. But I, it may have been a combination of just you know being in traffic and and, and other things that happen. Uh, but so I think that, that expansion is, is that expansion pretty rare to have it fill in that quickly. I think it's a well. It, it's I think it's early to say exactly numbers, but I, I think it may be a record. It's definitely a record in width. They're saying 2.6 miles, and it's the largest ever on record since humans have tracked this. Um, as far as the the rate and growth of it expanding, it's right up there. I mean, I, I it may be the first time they've actually. I believe the Doppler and, and different things actually. There, the good thing about the tornado, if there's any good side of it, was there was a lot of data pulled out of it, and I think they're going to learn a lot from it. Um, there's some rumors that uh, Tim deployed these pods, and he was one of the first people to get, or the first person to get a pod in a tornado and capture data and all these different things. You know, because he was a genius. This guy was a genius. He he wasn't just out there for video. Actually, he, I don't even think he took video. He was in it for the science side. He put these measurements out. Um, but I'm just hoping that those those pods did actually capture some data out of it, because if so, you know, he would have captured data from the largest tornado on record. Um, you know, not that that makes the pain any better for for losing them, but um, you know, it just sure. It's kind of, you know, it's something positive to come out of it. Let's get some great data out of it. You know, let's um, so, let's so how it. how close ha uh, is I guess uh, for somebody like me who's never gone storm chasing, um, is is this just something that you consider all of you guys who do this regularly? It's it's part of it. You might this might happen to you, or do you really consider that a pretty minimal risk? Uh, to me, the biggest danger is driving, car accidents and things like that. But yeah, um, other people for sure more than yeah. the storms. Yeah, you gotta yeah. put it in the big perspective, though. I mean, you could study up on this. You could be doing it for 10, 20, 30 years, but you're not in control. You know, right. you gotta always remember that. You know, Mike said driving. You know, from other people to hydroplaning to getting stuck on a dirt road and unfortunately having something come at you. Um, but, you know, like I said, the big picture is you may know this. And Tim was one of the best. If you had told me at the beginning of this year that he was going to be the first mm -hmm. chaser to go, I would have shook my head and said, no way, you're out of your mind. So it just goes to show you could have all this knowledge and all this expertise and, and be one of the best at what you do, yet you are still not in control. So how, how often uh, do your cars just get the, a complete beating, you know, from hail and things like that? I mean, are you... Do you know ahead of time that your your car's toast? I think mine's getting better gas mileage because it's starting to turn into a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you gotta expect that. Mike's <laughs> car is beat up. I can attest. To that. Yeah. How how frequently are you replacing windshields and things like that? Every season. Uh, Every really? season, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so if you're taking your your beautiful Betty out storm chasing, bad move is what you're saying. Well, I, I think one of the first deterrents uh, to storm chasing for most people that think it's it's very exciting with little consequences is they run into the hail core. And uh, uh, it's worth noting that a lot of insurance companies are wising up, and uh, you know they're concerned about their rental cars. And you know if you deliberately take your vehicle out there and you don't have the proper insurance, you may be uh, out quite a quite a pretty penny. Hmm, that's interesting. I've always been curious, like uh, just how how risky it is. I mean, is it are you are, are you pretty much every season going to get caught up in some hail of significant size? If you're chasing, yeah. 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 All right. So I didn't know if that was just a twister moment or if that's real. Yeah, that, You're, no, that's, real. that's a really good yeah. question. Uh, I, I think some people uh, have different approaches. Some some look at the hail dents as uh, what like uh, uh, war war battle wounds. Battle wounds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I try not to lose my windshield, especially early in a chase, because if I lose the windshield, I may be done. Uh, so I go out of my way to try to work around the larger hail, uh, but it, you know there are a lot of hazards. Uh, not only hail, but flash flooding, uh, getting stuck in the mud, um, uh, lightning. Lightning is definitely a very yeah, realistic uh, sure. threat. Yeah, yeah. Kelly, wow. have you ever have you ever had any close calls with lightning? Me? Uh, Kelly. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've. Uh, well, just you know, whenever we were out in the. Uh, um, where was it on the border of Oklahoma? And we're standing, and you know, CG was hitting 
pretty quickly and it was probably a couple miles away and uh, we looked next to us and the lady's hair was standing straight up on end. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, just from the electrical field, you know, being, being that close. But yeah, I've had lightning hit, um, you know, uh, probably two, 300 yards. You know, it, it flashes and you, you're temporarily blinded and you can't hear anything and that type of thing. So, yeah, it's, we try not to get that lightning is probably one of the, the, the most unpredictable. And you have to be uh, extremely careful in, in that type of situation. Are any of you guys and, married? Yes, my families. <laughs> yeah, I was, are you, are y'all, are, are, are y'all, you're married, Kelly? Yes, I am. I have married and I have two children. And uh, the Mikes, you guys single? Married. Uh, I got a girlfriend that chases with me. Okay, I was gonna say I know I actually know Mike's not married because you got your your brother running around naked. <laughs> and no, no wife would put up with that. Jim, we already know the answer. And, How about you, and we know Jim's not married. <laughs> I'm dating my daughter. That's right. There's not okay. a married guy on here. It's got a cigar and a milkshake. I <laughs> no, Jim. Jim's way too cool to be married. <laughs> Hey, do you, know, right, just... when, do you know when you were in Austin, you, you, you've been standing next to a girl with her hair standing straight up, I bet. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure it was a girl. But in Austin, you can't really tell half the time. Uh, yeah. There was no right. lightning around, I guarantee it. Yeah. Well, I mean... Uh, but I mean, with as terrible as it was, uh, what happened with Tim and his son and, and all that, I mean... To my knowledge, that those were the first storm chasers uh, that died, right? Uh, from direct impact of a tornado. Now we've lost chasers, uh, usually involved in, in car crashes. So I agree yeah. with Mike Tice that, uh, and I've been the only two times I've been seriously injured in my career have both comes at the hands of another driver. Yeah. Uh, so that I would agree. The number one risk uh, in my experience is is being out on the road. Now yes. you guys all talked early on about the circus. What? Give me a clue. When you when you're chasing and, and you've got whatever some really big atmospheric event. Oh, is somebody, going on. somebody in here's got to have a shot of all the cars lining yeah. up a road or something. What, what are we talking about? Is there is there I can find 10 one cars or twenty like cars? Lining, literally lining the entire road. Cars parked yeah, all the way I, down. Well, hey, when you it, it was kind of surreal down. talking to y'all for me because we were my son lives in Oklahoma City. And he lives right there in um, Midwest, uh, Midwest City, Dell City area. And so we were real concerned for him. And we were watching the Weather Channel. And they, <clears throat> where do we, while y'all are up there shooting this, and um, they're showing the Weather Channel car, you know, right when it flipped and, and everything. And they're talking to this, to this happening. But literally, they pick up the local news broadcast and they're telling people to leave their home and drive south. The news. Uh, yeah. The local news said that, and then I heard that they got some crap about that afterwards. What do y'all? Did y'all hear anything about that? Uh, I was stuck in that traffic. That the the, the news you're talking about the May third first day. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were we originally targeted a storm south of there near Chickasha that because we knew kind of like what may happen up in that area, considering it's by Oklahoma City. But uh, on the way towards the storm, this is after the tornado. Uh, we saw it was basically a mass exodus of El Reno, Oklahoma City, all that. We saw people driving down the wrong way of highways that weren't even counterflow. Um, we saw people driving across fields. Um, we, we had trouble getting to the storm because people were driving in the wrong direction in lanes. So uh, I, I don't want to say anything about you know what the media said, but... Uh, it, well, well I, I'm telling you, I was watching it, and they're telling, leave your home, drive south. And I was surprised because, you know, the typical thinking is take shelter. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's going to be uh, uh, studied and, and uh, investigated if it hasn't already. I, I think some some uh, people have been held accountable. I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah. you know, uh, the Weather Service is, uh, you know, also concerned about that. I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but I, I know that uh, uh, it's important to remember, too, that I believe the more uh, tornado had just happened within a couple of weeks before this mm -hmm. day. So uh, there was a lot said that in order to survive the more tornado, 
uh, you really had to be underground or get in your car and get out of its way. But they already knew because it was on the ground for quite some time and it was considered a very violent, uh, uh, possibly, you know, a tornado capable of creating, you know, EF5 damage. So uh, this one wasn't. This formed very quickly. And, and then they were already saying, you know, something similar. And I think people in some cases just took it upon themselves to just, you know, kind of get out of Dodge. You guys yeah. mentioned the circus, and I've got a shot. This isn't my shot, but um, I'll switch over here. I, this is uh, 2010, and uh, it is from just north of Oklahoma. Uh, you guys see my screen now? No, you see my face. Okay, there we go. There you go. All right, so this is oh rural, my God. Yeah. rural Oklahoma, and yeah. if you look at the cars, I am the sixth car from the left. And uh, that whole line of cars was in front of us as well for a couple miles. So you had probably about three, four hundred vehicles on the road. Okay. Now was this was this people trying to get out of Dodge, or was this no, people chasing the storm? These are people chasing. Wow. Uh, these were parents who. These are people who threw their kids and the dog in the car and went out, and they're pointing at the storm. Uh, these people that you know were part of Vortex. You can see one of their Dopplers right there behind. Actually, yeah. directly right to us. You could see people standing on the side of the road on the right-hand side trying to cross, get back to their car that was parked. Um, and this created a hazard because back in basically to the right of the frame, back in the rain there, was a fairly large tornado moving in our direction. Um, and we're moving maybe 20, 25 miles an hour. And uh, what ended up happening is this, we went into a town, I think it's Guthrie that we went into, and uh, people were hitting stoplights. So it was literally stop-and-go traffic and uh, we can only go so fast, yet this tornado is moving towards us at a pretty good clip. So uh, we managed to get over to 35 and, and haul south just in time. But uh, this is kind of, this is a really, really bad situation. I mean, um, this is... Now, now, is that uncommon? I mean, you're talking about a couple of hundred cars. Is that pretty common to have that many people, like, just following around storms? It depends. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I'll, I'll, let me let me show you if I can. Can I click on screen share? Sorry. Yep. You need to do player. All right, here you go. All right, so <laughs> this. All right, this is two years later. Can you see that? Yeah. All right, so the uh, car is going. These are all chasers. This was April twelfth, uh, two thousand and uh, what would that be? Twelve. You're telling me there's people chasing in a Toyota Tercel or something? <laughs> oh, I, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if we see somebody on a moped next year. Dude, if, I mean, I've if seen people that, chasing yeah, a Jeep. You could probably flip that to herself. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, people are coming from all over the U.S. Uh, they come in from out of the country. They rent cars. Uh, I want to go back to something that uh, I think um, uh, uh, Kelly mentioned. Uh, Mike's also involved is one of the ways to learn is to also go with one of these storm chase tours. Uh, Kelly and I are with Tempest Tours, Mike's with Cloud9. There are other very reputable, very experienced tour companies. But by going out with them, A, you don't, you're don't you not taking a vehicle out, so you're not contributing to the problem. B, you're with experts who will limit your risks. And you can get out there and, and see you know these beautiful sites like we photographed. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But yeah, the traffic situation is becoming critically important and dangerous. Wow. Yeah. So in my mind, when I think about storm chasing, you know, you're up in Kansas and there's a storm forming and you guys are hitting all these little byways and highways and off roads and dirt roads trying to find the right angle. Are all of those little, you know, main roads and off roads and dirt roads just jam packed with people? Yep. The El Reno day, definitely. Those pictures they just showed, the El Reno day, normally when you're heading east, your escape route is to the south. Every south road looked just like that. We would go to the next one, couldn't get south. It was just traffic jams everywhere. And not only that, now we start having trees, tree limbs coming down in trees because the winds were so strong. This was such a powerful storm that now tree limbs were blocking the road. I mean, just, we had that as well as floods were going over the road, traffic jams. Total chaos, and I think that to me the El Reno day is a big changing point in storm in the storm chasing um, in storm chasing, and I think uh, I think I, there's going to be a few people that may think twice about storm chasing again because they got scared so badly, and they felt so small uh, on that particular day. I and I, I guess there's really in a rural area too. 
I mean, in a yeah. rural area, you know, close to Oklahoma City or Dallas, depending on what time of, you know, if it's if it's late in the day, which most storms go up late in the day, if it's close to Oklahoma City, um, there's going to be lots of, you know, I don't mean to point out just Oklahoma City, but just a rural area that people can drive to in a day to be able to get there. Um, that that's, that definitely in, impacts, you know, I don't think that I was up in a, I was in Norman, uh, both the Moore and El Reno days, and we decided to go south just because of the danger of being in a metro area and not wanting to chase and, uh, you know, chasing that particular situation because, you know, over the years it has gotten particularly dangerous, in, in my opinion. So Now, is this, uh, uh, I, I think would you consider close to it gets. Would you consider this like uh, the Discovery uh, Channel effect, so to speak, that since those storm chasing shows have come out, there's more and more people showing up? Is there a direct correlation? I think there's a spike. I think Twister, there was a big spike. and yeah. then Twister, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when I, when I read, everybody when... needing content, right? Yeah, I, I actually wrote about this. Shot and... go ahead. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. I think with you know social media too added on to Discovery Channel yep. and other types of programs that feature on this, but you know there's more and more people that want to go out and get a shot, you know, and put it up on a Facebook feed or, you know, the uh, news media as well. And there's so many more news media outlets out there that they send every single news media outlet instead of, you know, using one, one or just a handful of, of photographers, known photographers, to get their media. They, they They'll send people out to get footage and, for them, and, and they encourage the public. Yeah. They're encouraging yeah. people: send in your photos, send in what you have, but right. do it safely, you know. But it's in, it's encouraging them, so it's yeah. I believe social media is a big reason for it as well. Well, I'm yeah, curious what the what Weather Channel do with that footage. You know, of have they tried to kind of suppress the video of what's that guy's name, Brandon, that was in the car and the hay bales are hitting them, hitting their car. Oh, uh, Brandon and Ivy, yeah. I'm yeah, Sullivan, I mean, it, yeah, you know, that played over and over like a loop for a while. But I, you know, you typ typical TV responses they'll make a they'll make a special about it, not not discourage it. You know. Well, I, I think they're they're you never. I mean, the news media always wants a dramatic shot or dramatic footage, mm -hmm. and the bar just keeps getting raised and raised and raised. And and I think you know, I've I've written about storm chasing uh, since '92. Uh, for popular science, for Scientific American, and I noticed a distinct change, meaning people getting more interested in storm chasing. Actually, back when they started running the Nova specials, uh, anytime they did any kind of special on TV, it got good ratings, and then Twister was without a doubt a milestone. That really uh, ignited, uh, you know, it, it brought the, the term storm chaser into the kitchen. And, and uh, the, the, the series Storm Chasers, all the specials that have followed. But I would also argue that today's technology, everybody with smartphones now can have radar on their phone. And I think they feel that as long as they've got that little device in their hand, they've got a car, and they can you know, keep an eye on that radar, uh, hey, this looks fun. And uh, what they don't realize, it's more like going on a, an African safari, and, and we all want to see the tiger or you know, the, the really fascinating animal, but they don't realize that there's there's no structure to keep them in. I mean, this 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 subject can kill you. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, everybody's got their uh, smartphone with uh, you know. I don't know if you guys can see it on my smartphone showing the clouds going over Austin and the rain totals. And so, are people literally hitting the road with something as arcane uh, as this and thinking they're going to stay safe? Some. I, I think it's a. I think it's a higher number than we realize. Uh, I, I've, I'm meeting an increasing number of people every year that uh, say they get more out of doing this than uh, the risk concerns them, and I don't think they understand the risk. Um, and doesn't that doesn't that doesn't that image that he just showed? Didn't that? I thought that was 15 to 20 minutes delayed. Anyway, it's like a stock ticker. I mean, you know, you go to the Weather Channel, what you're seeing is not what's happening right now. 
Well, and the other thing is, are you qualified to really interpret what you're seeing? Let's say it's only five minutes old, but yeah. can, you, can you recognize a violent gust front that, that's ahead of the main, the parent storm? Uh, there was a, a, a what a state fair a couple of years ago where the, uh, the 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 storm came in rapidly and uh, toppled over the concert uh, grid yeah. and onto the people. And I, it's my understanding that that, that at least uh, somebody reading their smartphone radar played a, a role in, in not clearing that place out. So yeah. I, I think it really depends also on your knowledge. That happened in Fort Worth about five years ago at a thing called Mayfest and they, it actually came through the hail actually went straight through the windshield in the reporter's car. It was just going straight through without a, you know, pounding it. So, uh, but yeah, I, I was woken up in the middle of the night about 2 a.m. two years ago here in Firemount, Texas. and. The radio said, uh, I, I didn't realize how unprepared I was at home because you think you got all this technology. I've got internets and phones and computers and TVs and everything else. But my power was out, and I, I don't own a radio. I didn't realize, I didn't even think about it, but I don't even own a radio outside of my car radio. And it said, the last thing I could hear, it says, rain wrap tornado. You won't be able to see it. So, of course, what does a guy do? He goes out and opens the door, and I open the door, and all I see is blackness <laughs> and wind. And now, I didn't know if I should go take shelter or what. But you did can't you say anything that, from those? That did stuff. you say that you've got internets at your house? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, just, I, don't know, I mean, I, don't, I mean, I know you're cool like that, but I didn't know you've got internets. I've got, I've got the interweb as well. Yeah. That's pretty. That's pretty tight. Now I know why Trey leaves yeah. you in charge of the show when he's gone because you got internets. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Um, I think um, that's our time. Our show's probably wrapping up here. Curtis, do you have any big wrap-up moment that you have planned? I know you've been planning for months for this. No, no, actually, I was told about two days ago that I should do this, and so <laughs> I was thankful for, uh, I will, special thanks to Kelly, who helped get all these guys connected, and I uh, appreciate that, and I appreciate all y'all coming on at the last minute. I know y'all didn't, it's it's interesting world how, um, People get to their photography careers, which would be another good show to have you on because uh, much of Trey's audience has come through this social media channel, and uh, many of y'all didn't even have Google Plus profiles before we we started the uh, the deal. Yet you're quite well known as well. So um, two different worlds. Uh, I saw a cartoon one time that said uh, a man and a wife, and he says she was she was on Twitter and he was on Facebook and yet they lived one mile apart and didn't know each other, you know. <laughs> um, and well, I guess I offended Kelly. He just dropped it. So <laughs> he didn't like that joke. That was his story. Oh my gosh, I went two hours. And that joke. Okay. Anyway, oh but I appreciate y'all uh, getting on. It seemed like the technology was good and we were just super impressed with your stories and your uh, the knowledge y'all have, you're all like meteorologists. You, I think you know more than uh, my local meteorology guy. Yeah, hey, I got one last question for you guys. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, uh, maybe like Jim, but, you know, certainly the mics as well. I only say maybe Jim because he's been doing it for so long, but is there a certain rock star quality to you guys when you're out in the field? I mean, are, do, do some of the storm chasers start recognizing you and maybe start trying to follow you because of that? Only because I sell Amway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, do you, do you have certain people recognize you out in the field and then you can't uh, shake them? Yeah, you know, I, my mind's pretty much dumb luck. You know, I did a couple of shows that, that get repeated all the time. Uh, my apologies to everybody about that on the Weather Channel. I, I appreciate the, the, the broadcast, but, you know, you do this long enough, and and I'm pre-Twister, which I'm very grateful for, and, and I, I salute James because I'd give anything to start over and just start fresh because it's, it's so exciting. But um, yeah, they'll they'll come up and, and everybody's polite and, and I love it though. I, I love speaking and, and teaching and, and doing these photo tours. Uh, uh, I, I you know I'm, I yeah I love it. Well, I, I learned something new. I guess you all date yourself as BT and AT. You know, before <laughs> Twister, after Twister. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> Who knew it? You know, that was probably the last thing I I've, I've ever seen Helen Hunt anyway. So um, she's on my list. <laughs> it, I'm on my list not to see, by the way. <laughs> oh. 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 
Yeah. Um, well, I don't uh, figure she's going to be on the show anytime soon, was she, Gino? I'm not. <laughs> well, you know what? It's funny you say that. We did have Helen Hunt lined up. Uh, oh, oh no. Week. Yeah, I think that's over now. Yeah. I'll but, uh, that's all right because we had Mel Paxson lined up, and he didn't like my imitation of him, so he's yeah. not coming yeah. either. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, we're going to – here's here's the plan. We're going to say goodbye to our our, our uh, broadcast audience, and that will cut the video, and then it will be available for archive soon. Um, but we can stay around and chat for a few minutes if y'all got a minute. So uh, that is the end of the broadcast. And what is Gino? What is the move that Trey does? Is this the move? He goes and scene. Scene. Yes. Thanks.